Unit One, Listening, Part Four, Exercise Four, Speaker One. It's funny because I was never really aware of just what an extraordinary woman my aunt Patty was. I mean, she was always away working, so I didn't really see too much of her. When she invited me to come out on one of her trips, it was a real eye opener to see what she was doing. I suppose she was unconventional in that not many women are attracted to that sort of job. She'd be out in all weathers, even in these really mountainous seas. But you know, she never used to panic. She just got on with the job, whatever the danger. She was totally competent, even when things got really rough. And do you know, she'd never learnt to swim. Speaker two. For my dad, nothing was too much trouble, especially when people showed a bit of interest in what he was up to. You know, when he was working, he'd be digging away at some excavation or other, and members of the public, visitors, would just come up to him and start talking to him, and he'd drop whatever he was doing. And you know, even if he'd been working all day, he'd be really conscientious about giving him a complete tour of the site with a free lecture thrown in. And personally, I wouldn't have that sort of patience. But then I guess I take more after my mother, who's always in a rush. Speaker three. My brother's a real perfectionist. You know, he's been spending a lot of time recently getting this new show ready, and he's been going to incredible lengths to get this new trick right. Like he's been practicing and practicing in front of this video camera he's got for weeks. It seems it's been driving the rest of us mad. What he does is play it back afterwards, the camera, I mean, to check you can't see how it's done from any angle. He just wants to hoodwink absolutely everyone. You know how observant kids are, especially. So he goes on and on till he's totally satisfied. Speaker four. Ivan was really one of my dad's mates, but we counted him as one of the family, and he was one of those outgoing types who could speak to anyone and incredibly generous with us kids. Always came back with some unusual gift or other from his trips. And then he'd sit down with us and help us do our schoolwork and so on. We loved him, and we loved his stories of his underwater adventures and the strange creatures he'd seen. He made it sound as if he'd been doing something extremely dangerous, and he'd been incredibly brave. No doubt we were a bit naive, but we lapped it all up. Speaker five. Margot was one of my mother's cousins, actually. Personally, I never got to know her well because she was always travelling here and there. She had so many engagements. I've got a few of her recordings from her younger days, though. The sound quality is not too good now because we've listened to them so many times. You know, after a time, the vinyl gets worn out. But I think her playing really does reflect her optimism and joy. You just wouldn't suspect that she was going blind at the time. What courage in the face of such an affliction, don't you think? Unit One, speaking part one, exercise two, Marta. Yes, I was able to give a friend a room once when she had to move out of her house quite quickly. She'd been having problems with one of her flatmates, so she came to stay with us for a while, just for a few months. And I think that helped her quite a lot in her situation, which wasn't easy for her because she was studying at university, and it was a long way from her family home. Lucas, one of the best is from the summer vacations which we always used to spend together as a family at the seaside. I used to do quite a lot of sport with my dad, you know,、uh, playing tennis, swimming, that sort of thing. And I remember one time we went water skiing, which was a great new experience for me. Yes, that's a very good one because I loved being close to my dad and doing things with him. You know, things I wouldn't have done with my mum. Unit one, speaking part one, exercise three. Marta, can you tell me, have you ever had the opportunity to really help a friend? Yes, I was able to give a friend a room once when she had to move out of her house quite quickly. 
she'd been having problems with one of her flatmates, so she came to stay with us for a while, just for a few months, and I think that helped her quite a lot in her situation, which wasn't easy for her because she was studying at university, and it was a long way from her family home. Thank you. Lucas, a question for you. What's your happiest childhood memory? One of the best is from the summer vacations which we always used to spend together as a family at the seaside. I used to do quite a lot of sport with my dad, you know, uh, playing tennis, swimming, that sort of thing. And I remember one time we went water skiing, which was a great new experience for me. Yes, that's a very good one because I loved being close to my dad and doing things with him, you know, things I wouldn't have done with my mum. Unit 2. Starting off. Exercise 2. 1. 1. Where I live, people tend to be bilingual. They speak the original and the national language, and they switch between languages with ease. As a result, they seem to find it easier to learn other languages as well. At least, I know quite a lot of people who speak several foreign languages. 2. People do worry a bit about how the language is changing. I think due to globalization, I suppose, lots of fashionable loan words are coming into the language, particularly from English. So my mother tongue's not at all the same as it was, say, 50 years ago. Personally, I don't know if that's a bad thing. I mean, if people find it easier to express themselves using loan words, then perhaps they should. 3. I find it frustrating because I spent years trying to reach an advanced level, but now my English has got a bit rusty because I don't use it very often, and that's a pity. 4. I spent years at school studying Spanish and never learned to speak it well. I guess I should have been sent on an exchange to a Spanish or a Mexican school for six months or thereabouts, because everyone knows that living in the country, you just pick up the language naturally, and that's just about the best way to learn it. 5. I'm really dedicated to studying languages. I aim to achieve an excellent command of English, which means becoming highly articulate and being able to use the language accurately and effortlessly. 6. Language is a tool for achieving other things, and frankly I wouldn't consider accuracy to be as important as fluency when learning a foreign language. I think the main thing is to make oneself understood. 7. We live in a highly competitive world. Countries compete with each other, employers compete with each other, and people compete. Consequently, we should be teaching young people to use language for persuasion rather than self-expression. It's all very well being able to say what you think and feel, but you've got to be able to sell yourself, sell your product, achieve your aims. Unit 2 Listening Part 1 Exercise 2 Extract 1 I find not knowing the local language is the most frustrating thing when travelling, but you made a conscious decision to learn it when you were in Mongolia, didn't you? Not so much conscious. I sort of picked it up after I arrived and I found it really helped me settle into the area and talk to folk there. Otherwise, I'd have had to use an interpreter, which I certainly couldn't afford. How long were you there? Oh, nearly a year. And it was great really being able to get some understanding of people's real interests and concerns. And now you speak the language fluently? Well, I reckon I can more or less hold my own in a conversation. So do you think the key to good language learning is to be naturally gifted? It certainly helps. And it's not a gift we all have. I'm fairly outgoing and uninhibited, and that helps too. I mean, you won't get very far if you're scared of making a fool of yourself. What's essential, though, is application. You know, just getting stuck into it and making the effort. 
Well, that's the key to learning almost anything. I mean, you don't learn other things like maths or tennis just by being uninhibited. <laughs> <laughs> I find not knowing the local language is the most frustrating thing when travelling, but you made a conscious decision to learn it when you were in Mongolia, didn't you? Not so much conscious. I sort of picked it up after I arrived, and I found it really helped me settle into the area and talk to folk there. Otherwise, I'd have had to use an interpreter, which I certainly couldn't afford. How long were you there? Oh, nearly a year, and it was great really being able to get some understanding of people's real interests and concerns. And now you speak the language fluently? Well, I reckon I can more or less hold my own in a conversation. So, do you think the key to good language learning is to be naturally gifted? It certainly helps, and it's not a gift we all have. I'm fairly outgoing and uninhibited, and that helps too. I mean, you won't get very far if you're scared of making a fool of yourself. What's essential, though, is application. You know, just getting stuck into it and making the effort. Well, that's the key to learning almost anything. I mean, you don't learn other things like maths or tennis just by being uninhibited. <laughs> <laughs> Extract two. I came across something in a magazine recently that mentioned that spelling reform would cut the space writing takes up by about fifteen percent. Imagine newspapers, libraries, and bookshops with fifteen percent more room. And then I remembered the trauma of learning spelling at primary school. You know, doing those dictations where we had to put a double p in approve and spelling right with g h t. It's frankly absurd, and I'd support the idea of simplified spelling just to save kids that. But it's part of the character and beauty of the language. Not everything has to be reduced to something functional. Maybe not, but as a language teacher, it'd make my life a lot easier because my students would immediately know how to say new words correctly. So I wouldn't have to spend so much time teaching pronunciation. You hope. But think of the downside of reprinting every book and replacing every road sign.、Mm. What a cost! I think you're being unrealistic. Quite honestly, mind you, I've heard a lot about how long it takes some English kids to learn to read, and apparently our spelling system's a major factor there. If you can call it a system, so you might have something there. I came across something in a magazine recently that mentioned that spelling reform would cut the space writing takes up by about fifteen percent. Imagine newspapers, libraries, and bookshops with fifteen percent more room. And then I remembered the trauma of learning spelling at primary school. You know, doing those dictations where we had to put a double p in approve and spelling right with g h t. It's frankly absurd, and I'd support the idea of simplified spelling just to save kids that. But it's part of the character and beauty of the language. Not everything has to be reduced to something functional. Maybe not, but as a language teacher, it'd make my life a lot easier because my students would immediately know how to say new words correctly. So I wouldn't have to spend so much time teaching pronunciation. You hope. But think of the downside of reprinting every book and replacing every road sign.、Mm. What a cost! I think you're being unrealistic. Quite honestly, mind you, I've heard a lot about how long it takes some English kids to learn to read, and apparently our spelling system's a major factor there. If you can call it a system, so you might have something there. Extract three. You know the problem for overseas candidates at job interviews is that the candidates often lack the sort of cultural background that would stand them in good stead in these situations. So while their English is up to scratch, their responses take the interviewer by surprise. They get a question like, "What do you most enjoy about your present job?" Where the interviewer is expecting something about the challenge or working with friendly colleagues or such like, and the interviewee is completely thrown. Perhaps in their culture, they don't equate work with pleasure at all. So they talk about the status the job gives them or the money. 
This is often combined with sort of closed facial expressions, so the interviewer finds the response difficult to interpret. You're right, and I think the evidence shows that for many jobs, a better approach might be to set up a job simulation to see whether the candidate has the requisite skills and attitude. Exactly, and although interviews will always be necessary, interviewers need to be trained not to read too much into people's answers, but to give people practical opportunities to demonstrate their usefulness. Though getting the questions right and learning to interpret the responses more accurately would also be useful training for many interviewers, I think. You know, the problem for overseas candidates at job interviews is that the candidates often lack the sort of cultural background that would stand them in good stead in these situations. So while their English is up to scratch, their responses take the interviewer by surprise. They get a question like, what do you most enjoy about your present job? Where the interviewer is expecting something about the challenge or working with friendly colleagues or such like, and the interviewee is completely thrown. Perhaps in their culture, they don't equate work with pleasure at all, so they talk about the status the job gives them or the money. This is often combined with sort of closed facial expressions, so the interviewer finds the response difficult to interpret. You're right, and I think the evidence shows that for many jobs, a better approach might be to set up a job simulation to see whether the candidate has the requisite skills and attitude. Exactly, and although interviews will always be necessary, interviewers need to be trained not to read too much into people's answers, but to give people practical opportunities to demonstrate their usefulness. Though getting the questions right and learning to interpret the responses more accurately would also be useful training for many interviewers, I think. Unit 2. Speaking, Part 2. Exercise 3. In this part of the test, I'm going to give each of you three pictures. I'd like you to talk about two of them on your own for about a minute and also to answer a question briefly about your partner's pictures. Here are your pictures. They show people explaining things. I'd like you to compare two of the pictures and say what the speakers might be explaining and what problems the speakers might have. OK. Uh, in this photo, there's a team coach who looks as if he's explaining tactics to a team of teenage boys, perhaps at half time. Um, the boys give the impression that they're a bit tired or perhaps disheartened, judging by the expressions on their faces. So perhaps he's trying to boost their morale. <laughs> in the other photo, there's a lawyer um, a barrister, I think they're called, who seems to be arguing a case to the court. She appears to be defending her client and trying to persuade the jury that he's innocent. Mm. Uh, in both photos, I imagine the explanation is vital. The coach wants his team to go back on the pitch and win the match while the barrister wants to win her case by persuading the jury to reach a verdict of not guilty. I think both speakers have very similar problems because their success depends entirely on the words they use, although the outcome is something they have no direct control over. Thank you. Unit 3. Listening. Part 2. Exercise 3. This week's All in the Mind examines an unusual condition you may never have heard of before. Prosopagnosia. Here's Professor Alexander Sharma to explain. Hello. Well, let's start with an image some of you may be familiar with. A painting called The Son of Man by the surrealist artist René Magritte. In the picture, an apple floats in front of a man's face, covering the features that would normally allow him to be recognised. The painting perfectly illustrates the concept of prosopagnosia, or face blindness. Unit 3. Listening, Part 2. Exercise 4. This week's All in the Mind examines an unusual condition you may never have heard of before. Prosopagnosia. Here's Professor Alexander Sharma to explain. Hello. 
Well, let's start with an image some of you may be familiar with, a painting called The Son of Man by the surrealist artist René Magritte. In the picture, an apple floats in front of a man's face, covering the features that would normally allow him to be recognised. The painting perfectly illustrates the concept of prosopagnosia, or face blindness. To people with this condition, as soon as someone leaves their sight, the memory of that person's face is blank, or at best, a set of jumbled features. Face blindness is a little like tone deafness. The tone can be heard, or the face seen, but distinguishing between different tones, or faces, is nearly impossible. The effects of prosopagnosia can be so bad that people severely affected can't recognise their own parents or children. If we understood how the normal brain recalls faces, we'd be well on the way to understanding this strange disorder. It might also help us to understand human evolution, since the ability to recognise faces is more or less equal to the ability to recognise individuals. This ability helps to hold society together, and has enabled human beings to develop a complex culture which is unique in the animal kingdom. The question scientists need to answer is whether this basic ability has its own private brain mechanism, or whether it's simply one aspect of a general ability to recognise individual members of a particular class of objects. Researchers have used face-blind volunteers to explore this question. The subjects were shown images of cars, tools, guns, houses and landscapes, and also black and white pictures of faces with no hair on their heads. Ten of these images were repeated. The subjects were asked to indicate, as quickly as possible, whether each image they saw was new or repeated. The results were surprising. None of the face-blind subjects could recognise the faces in the series well, but they could distinguish between the other repeated pictures as easily as people without prosopagnosia could. That confirms the idea that faces are handled differently by the brain from other objects. It's been shown in experiments that people with face blindness can be taught to improve their face recognition skills, but it's still not known what prosopagnosia sufferers are missing when they recall a blur instead of a face. This is not to say that prosopagnosia has no advantages. As one person with the condition writes on her website, you can wake up in the morning and pretend you don't know your own kids. Then you don't have to give them any pocket money. Unit 3. Speaking Part 3. Exercise 2. I have to admit it's only recently that I started getting stressed about things. I think it coincides with when I started my new job. Really? So what makes you feel stressed? Oh, all kinds of things. Obviously having too much to do, you know, not having enough time to do everything they want me to do. Then I start thinking, my manager's got it in for me, or that she doesn't like me and is making my life difficult deliberately. Do you know what I mean? Yes, I know exactly what you mean. You start by blaming someone else and then you decide it's your fault, that you're inadequate. That's when the stress starts. Exactly. Then, because you're working so hard and thinking about work even when you're not there, it starts to affect other parts of your life. I lost my temper with my boyfriend last week for no real reason, just because I'd had a hard day at work. I apologised afterwards, of course, but I could tell he was quite upset. That's one of the worst effects of stress, isn't it? Yes, it is. Other people are affected if you're stressed, often people you care about. But, you know, you're lucky. At least you have a job. I've been really stressed recently because I can't find a job and I'm running out of money. What will you do? I don't know. I could borrow some from my parents, but I'd prefer not to. And if I tell them I'm short of money, they'll start to worry. And I don't want them worrying because of me. That'll make everything worse, and I'll get even more stressed. It's a vicious circle. So what do you do if you're feeling stressed? Well, I thought about going to the doctor and asking for some pills, but then I thought, there must be better ways of dealing with it than drugs. So if I'm feeling particularly stressed after a day at work, I do one of two things. Either I phone a friend and suggest we go out for the evening, or I go to the gym, 
What about you? I find talking about my problems is quite helpful. You often find there are lots of people in the same situation, or even a worse situation than you. That helps me get things into perspective. And I always try to find reasons to be optimistic. For example, I've got two interviews next week, and I'm determined to get one of the jobs. That'll make things easier for me. And I spend time with friends, and I try relaxation techniques. Have you tried that? No, but perhaps I will. Unit four, listening part two, exercise three. Hi. Well, as you know, I've been doing a project on cooperatives, their history, and what they're like today. Um. Although farmers and people have always worked together from prehistory onwards, what we know today as cooperatives really got going during the Industrial Revolution. They were frequently started by workers in situations where perhaps their companies were exploiting them or mistreating them in some way, and they were seen as a way of providing protection for employees. The first one to really last and make a go of things was set up in a town in the north of England, Rochdale, about a hundred and seventy years ago. The local textile workers had gone on strike, but then their employer, who ran the local shop, the company shop, retaliated by refusing to sell them food. Rather than starve, they started a cooperative food store whose purpose was to provide basic foodstuffs just so people could survive. The employer in question then went a step further by refusing to sell gas to the striking employees. So, because they had no light, the cooperative started selling candles as well, even though that hadn't been part of their original plan. Well. From those conflictive origins, the movement was born, and there are still cooperatives around today, ones which have been around for more than a hundred years, running whole groups of shops in a region or over the whole country, or offering banking and insurance. There are also ones which have been started very recently and are involved in all sorts of new technologies, such as wind farms or designing internet sites and the like. So, what is a cooperative exactly? Well, they're regulated by law and are run as competitive businesses. They, of course, have to compete with conventional commercial businesses. The difference being that instead of having shareholders, they have members, and these people can be almost anyone. They may be residents in the case of a housing cooperative, or customers, perhaps if it's a chain of stores, as well as members of staff. Anyone really who might benefit from the existence of the cooperative. Any money the cooperative makes can be shared out between members if they so wish, because when it comes to determining what the cooperative should do in any given situation, everyone has an equal say. So, what makes them different from commercial businesses? Well, for many people, the strong attraction which sets them apart and is really boosting their popularity at the moment is that they follow a tough ethical code. Cooperatives believe they should go about things in a different way from conventional companies, and this means that, for example, a financial cooperative like the cooperative bank won't put money into a company whose activities it disapproves of. You know, a company involved in selling weapons to dodgy regimes, or one which might be contributing to global warming by being a fossil fuel producer. That sort of thing. All in all, the cooperative movement offers an alternative to people who are disenchanted with conventional business models, and a way forward for people who want to bring real change to the world. Thank you. Unit four, speaking part four, exercise six. Danielle, many people dream of being able to work from home. What do you think are the advantages and disadvantages of working from home? Well, let me think. Yes, I think I'd say that for most people there are a number of positive features. The most important one, perhaps, is that you don't waste time commuting, which can be quite stressful, especially if your train's late or you can't find a parking space, and that you work in your own time and at your own pace. 
Also, you don't have to dress smartly to go to work, which for me would be a definite plus. On the downside, it might be quite difficult to, uh, how do you say it, to disconnect from your job because your office is at home, so you're always checking your emails. Although I think that's a problem people have, even if they work in an office, their email follows them everywhere. Laura, do you agree with Danielle? Yes, although for people with small children, the biggest advantage is that they can combine working life with family life. I mean, they don't have to give up work when they start a family. Lara, which do you think is more important in a job? Friendly colleagues or a good salary? Oh, I think both are essential. Unless there's a good atmosphere in the workplace, people soon lose motivation or lose interest, and this affects the quality of their work. Also, employees need to feel valued, and in the end, this comes down to how much they're paid. If they're not well paid for the job they do, they'll feel that their work's not respected. And Danielle, what do you think? Well, I'm not sure, because I think for me, the most important thing is to feel that you're doing something useful, achieving something worthwhile in your job. If people have that impression, then they're not so worried about their pay and they can get their social life in their free time. I'd say it's more important to be efficient than friendly. Danielle, many people complain about their managers. What qualities would you look for in a perfect manager and why? I think he or she has to be a good communicator who tells you what's going on and is also pleasant to work with. He or she should be someone who gives you a reasonable workload and provides you with the support you need to do your job well and also someone who recognizes when you're working hard and gives you praise when you deserve it. Oh, I wish my boss was like that. <laughs> Unit 5. Listening, Part 1. Exercise 4. Extract 1. Are you all right now? Hmm, so-so. It comes and goes. I'm still having occasional flashbacks. What happened exactly? Well... I was doing my normal workout on the treadmill. I started with a gentle jog for 10 minutes or so. Then I decided I'd run fast fast 10 minutes. So I pressed the increase button. So then what happened? Well, nothing for a few seconds. But then the belt suddenly speeded up. I tried to slow it down, but nothing happened. When I tried pressing the slow down button, it was as if I was putting my foot on a, on a car accelerator. <gasps> that must have been terrifying. I've never trusted those control buttons. That's why I stopped going to the gym. Anyway, sorry, go on. What would you do? I looked round for help. I thought maybe someone could switch the electricity off. It would have been a very sudden jolt, but better than not stopping at all. In the end, all I could do was jump off and keep my fingers crossed. And that's how you broke your leg. Are you, go are you going to do anything about it? I'm not sure yet. I'm considering taking the company that runs the gym to court. That's what my solicitor suggests, but I'm, but I'm two minds about it. About Are you all right now? Hmm, so-so. It comes and goes. I'm still having occasional flashbacks. What happened exactly? Well, I was doing my normal workout on the treadmill. I started with a gentle jog for ten minutes or so. Then I decided to run fast for 10 minutes, so I pressed the increase button. So then what happened? Well, nothing for a few seconds, but then the belt suddenly speeded up. I tried to slow it down, but nothing happened. When I tried pressing the slow down button, it was as if I was putting my foot on a car accelerator. <gasps> that must have been terrifying. I've never trusted those control buttons. That's why I stopped going to the gym. Anyway, sorry, go on. What did you do? I looked round for help. I thought maybe someone could switch the electricity off. It would have been a very sudden jolt, but better than not stopping at all. In the end, all I could do was jump off and keep my fingers crossed. And that's how you broke your leg. Are you going to do anything about it? I'm not sure yet. I'm considering taking the company that runs the gym to court. That's what my solicitor suggests, but I'm in two minds about it. Extract 2 
OK, just tell me in your own words what happened, Mr Phillips. It's all a bit of a blur, I'm afraid. I understand you were on your way back from a holiday at around midnight, is that correct? Uh, yes, but I'd say it was nearer one o'clock. We were coming home from a holiday. We'd spent all day travelling, so I suppose we were pretty tired. How far were you from home? About half an hour. We were travelling fairly fast. The roads were empty and we were looking forward to a good night's sleep. Hmm. What's the first thing that happened? We were driving under a bridge when there was a crash of breaking glass and something hit my left arm. I managed to keep my right hand on the steering wheel, but I didn't have much control over the car. Before I knew what was happening, we'd left the road and were heading for a clump of trees. I was sure we'd had it. What's the next thing you remember? Well, everything happened so quickly. I remember coming round with people looking down at me. And when did you realise what had actually happened? When one of the paramedics showed me the stone that had come through the window and landed on the back seat. OK, just tell me in your own words what happened, Mr Phillips. It's all a bit of a blur, I'm afraid. I understand you were on your way back from a holiday at around midnight, is that correct? Uh, yes, but I'd say it was nearer one o'clock. We were coming home from a holiday. We'd spent all day travelling, so I suppose we were pretty tired. How far were you from home? About half an hour. We were travelling fairly fast. The roads were empty and we were looking forward to a good night's sleep. Hmm. What's the first thing that happened? We were driving under a bridge when there was a crash of breaking glass and something hit my left arm. I managed to keep my right hand on the steering wheel, but I didn't have much control over the car. Before I knew what was happening, we'd left the road and were heading for a clump of trees. I was sure we'd had it. What's the next thing you remember? Well, everything happened so quickly. I remember coming round with people looking down at me. And when did you realise what had actually happened? When one of the paramedics showed me the stone that had come through the window and landed on the back seat. Extract 3 So, what's your situation at the moment? We're sleeping at the local secondary school, like many of our neighbours. We're all in the same situation, just doing our best to look on the bright side. I've interviewed families in other towns and villages who are in more or less the same situation. Everyone's worried because they haven't been told when they can move back in. Have you heard anything? No, nothing. Apparently all our houses are still under a metre of water and it's still rising. It hasn't stopped raining since Tuesday. Can you tell me what happened in your case? Well... There's a river at the bottom of our garden. More of a sluggish stream most of the time, actually. Last weekend, with all the rain we'd had, it burst its banks. It was very quick once it started. I was frantically trying to stop it by digging ditches to take the water away. But there was too much of it. And in the end, I just gave up digging and got out as clear as possible. And what's the damage? Well, everything downstairs is ruined. We'll, we'll need new furniture and carpets, and we'll probably need to have the walls replastered. I keep thinking how disastrous it could have been. At one stage, I imagine seeing the whole building collapse. So, what's your situation at the moment? We're sleeping at the local secondary school, like many of our neighbours. We're all in the same situation, just doing our best to look on the bright side. I've interviewed food families in other towns and villages who are in more or less the same situation. Everyone's worried because they haven't been told when they can move back in. Have you heard anything? No, nothing. Apparently all our houses are still under a metre of water and it's still rising. It hasn't stopped raining since Tuesday. Can you tell me what happened in your case? Well... There's a river at the bottom of our garden, more of a sluggish stream most of the time, actually. Last weekend, with all the rain we'd had, it burst its banks. It was very quick once it started. I was frantically trying to stop it by digging ditches to take the water away, 
but there was too much of it. And in the end, I just gave up digging and got out as quickly as possible. And what's the damage? Well, everything downstairs is ruined. We'll need new furniture and carpets, and we'll probably need to have the walls replastered. I keep thinking how disastrous it could have been. At one stage, I imagine seeing the whole building collapse. Unit 5. Speaking, Part 2. Exercise 4. Here are your pictures. They show people doing dangerous jobs. I'd like you to compare two of the pictures and say what the dangers of the jobs might be and why people choose to do jobs like these. OK. Well, in this photo, there's a firefighter putting out a fire and he's almost certainly doing it to save lives and property. It's a pretty dangerous job because obviously he could die in a fire or get seriously burnt. And I suppose he's doing it because someone's got to do it. It must be a worthwhile occupation, you know, very rewarding when you save someone's life. And in this photo, there's a diver. He could be a police diver. He seems to be in a lake or it could be a river. It's probably quite dangerous because the water could be deep or there might be strong currents. There could be glass or other dangerous things in the water. I suppose police divers find their work quite exciting. I'm sure it's never boring and it's very worthwhile, though they must never know what they're going to find in the water. I don't really know why people do jobs like these. Perhaps they're people who get excitement from doing dangerous things. Unit 6. Starting off. Exercise 2. A. This portrait's one which I started from a photo of myself, actually. But after a time, I came to the conclusion that photos aren't that good when you're trying to be creative. You know, I found myself sort of imitating the photo, and that wasn't very satisfying. So I switched to drawing in front of a mirror instead. Anyway, I like this self-portrait because I think it reveals a bit about me, like that I'm quite neat, for example, perhaps a little unadventurous in the way I dress, not like most artists. But I think I've captured quite a sincere and thoughtful expression on my face. Also, I think I look quite sort of approachable, not at all threatening, someone it's nice to be around. <laughs> At least I hope so. B. You know, I've done quite a few portraits of friends and classmates and so on, normally from photos, and people are usually quite complimentary about them. But you should have heard some of the things my friend said about this one. We never see you concentrating like that. You're not like that at all. You're looking really serious. You see... I did the drawing in front of a mirror as a sort of experiment to see if I could do a self-portrait from life, like Rembrandt or Dali or someone, and I found I kept having to move my head, so my hair kept getting in the way and I got quite frustrated. It took me hours. Still, I'm quite proud of the way my eyes turned out. Sort of thoughtful and sincere. C. I've been looking at quite a few self-portraits recently because this one didn't turn out at all how I expected. Most artists look like they're really concentrating hard and you don't catch them smiling much. In this one, I look sort of uptight, moody, even a bit aggressive or perhaps a bit self-conscious. I'd just come back from holiday and my face was pretty tanned. I found it really hard to capture that tanned look combined with my fair hair in a black and white portrait. I'd like to look more relaxed, though. Unit 6. Listening, Part 3. Exercise 3. I'm delighted to be talking to artist Mike Myatt about his new portrait of actress Emily Curran, soon to be hung in the Bristol City Theatre, and to Emily herself, who's also with us to share her experience. Mike, you didn't paint Emily in your studio, did you? 
No, I put the finishing touches to my work in the studio, but I always prefer to paint my subjects in their own surroundings, with their objects and furniture around them. I find because they're on their own territory, so to speak, that they're more self-assured and comfortable, so they pose in a way that's more typical of them. That's what I attempt to capture, the person in their element, physically how they are. I've done a fair number of portraits that way, and it seems to work better. And, Emily, a new experience for you? Entirely, although as an actress, I'm used to directors and colleagues looking at me and being highly critical of my work, how I move, and paying very, very close attention to my performance. In this case, the attention was extremely intense right from the outset, and even in my own home, it was quite awkward to find a way of sitting that I felt happy with, so, in the end, as you can see, I stood. As an actress, I'm quite used to doing so for hours on end, so that was no hardship. And I thought, mistakenly, as it turned out, that I'd be able to daydream my way through the whole process and relax. <laughs> Mike, Emily's portrait was commissioned by the Bristol Theatre Society. But speaking more generally, why do people commission portraits of themselves? There can be any number of reasons. Unlike photos, which are mechanically produced images, portraits are an artist's interpretation of reality, the artist trying to see and present an image of the real person. They really are, visually, trying to tell the truth about that person. And in Emily's case, that's important, because you normally see her in the theatre playing someone else. Uh, speaking more generally, though, if you visit people's homes, you'll often see portraits hanging over the mantelpiece which have been in the family for generations, often with their favourite horse in front of their house or in the library with their books. And by and large, I'd say people have regarded their portraits as status symbols. Uh, not that I'm suggesting that in Emily's case. Although I am very proud of it and where it's going to hang. <laughs> <laughs> you don't paint from photographs, do you, Mike? No. During the painting process, a very personal connection is formed between the painter and the sitter. You watch the shadows pass across their face as you paint, so to speak, and as the hours pass with the changing lights and shades, you see the person in three dimensions, as you never would in a photo, and you paint that so that what you have, I believe, when you're successful, is a closer likeness than you could ever manage from copying a photo. I'm totally with Mike in his last remark. For me, the whole experience was nothing like what I'd been expecting. It was so much more intense and unsettling. As I said before, I'd been expecting to daydream all day, but Mike painted me standing staring directly at him, and I had to stand still with this very intense, concentrated man's eyes boring into me. Whenever my attention wandered, he'd say, You're not really looking at me, your mind's elsewhere. And I had to come back to the present. It was harder than any acting job, because I had to be myself through the entire process. I felt a huge sense of release when Mike announced he'd finished with me. So, Mike, do you feel you capture the personality of your sitters? No doubt I get some intuition about my subjects' personalities as I work with them, though we don't normally talk much because the process of painting takes up all my attention. Critics say that the person's personality comes through in great portraits, but I think that argument's a bit overstated. I feel that if I capture anything, it's my subjects' passing moods and emotions. People looking at the portraits later draw their own conclusions about character, and that's how the best art should be, shouldn't it? An interaction between the subject, the artist and the observer, where each one makes a contribution to something which never has one definitive result, but where each individual takes from it what they see at that moment. Unit 6. Speaking, Part 3. Exercise 1. Pair A. Now I'd like you to talk about something together for about two minutes. Here are some ways of encouraging young people to spend more time reading and a question for you to discuss. Talk to each other about how useful each of these experiences might be in encouraging young people to read more for pleasure. Do you read many books, Ivan? Not many, to tell you the truth. Well, I do. 
I'm studying literature at university, so I read a huge number of books. Not all for my own enjoyment, though. I do read some because they give me pleasure as well.、Hmm. Well, let's look at the task.、Uh, yes, I remember when I was at school that we used to read books together in class. You know, the teacher would read a bit, then we would take turns round the class, and then from time to time we'd discuss the book. Yes, I love doing that. For me, it was the high point of the week. I think that's what made me determined to study literature. That and reading with my mother when I was very small.、Mm. I'm not so sure about reading in class. I found it rather, how do you say, tedious, especially when it was the turn of someone who couldn't read very well. That was sort of painful. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but I had a teacher who loved books and was able to communicate her enthusiasm, which was fantastic.、Mm. And she helped us to dig below the surface, so we could really understand what the book was all about. Well, maybe you were luckier with your teacher than I was. I often felt I was just reading out of obligation, you know, something we had to do. Are you a fan of e-books? I guess not if you don't read much yourself. Well, actually, I think they might work quite well at getting young people to read more because kids get more involved if they can interact. I remember books when I was a child where you could choose options and then you were directed to another page depending on the option. So you were really choosing how the story developed. I like that idea. Pair B. Now I'd like you to talk about something together for about two minutes. Here are some ways of encouraging young people to spend more time reading, and a question for you to discuss. Talk to each other about how useful each of these experiences might be in encouraging young people to read more for pleasure. Well, I think reading the book when you've seen the film is really effective, because people want to continue the experience or find out more. Yes, although they're often disappointed by the book or the film. I mean, one is usually much better than the other. Then using e-books, I'm not sure. I think children often get distracted, especially when they're using one of those tablets. And there are lots of other things. Games and so on, not connected with the book. Yes, I agree. Now, reading a book in class, hmm, I think this is okay for small children. But do you think it really works with teenagers, for example? I'm not too sure. Well, maybe if they haven't picked up a reading habit by the time they're teenagers, it's too late. Yeah, maybe. I don't think library visits on their own are enough. Do you? I mean, young people have got to take out a book and do something at the end, like discuss it or write a review.、Mm, you're probably right, but I used to hate writing reviews. I think if you do that, you're not encouraging young people to read for pleasure. It sort of becomes just another chore,、uh, another piece of homework. Unit six, speaking, part three, exercise six. Now you have about a minute to decide which experience you think would be the most successful in encouraging young people to read more. Well, I think for me, seeing a film of the book would be the most effective because I can think of two or three books I've read as a result of going to the cinema. So it might well get young people into the habit. Do you agree? I think you're probably right. Perhaps for older children, although I'd strongly suggest reading in class as a great way to get kids into reading at a younger age. As long as they have the right sort of teacher to encourage them. Yes, with young children, it does come down to the quality of the teacher, doesn't it? That's perhaps where I missed out. Thank you. Unit seven, listening, part four, exercise one, one.
two. Three. So you wanna hang with the right one, tight one, the 2020 sight one. I'm getting a vision that we ain't gonna fight none. I'm getting a vision we got a long night, huh? Four. Five. Six. Seven. Eight. Nine. Unit seven. Listening part four. Exercise four. Speaker one. I've been involved in traditional music for about 15 years. In fact, ever since I was a kid. My father was very well known around here as a singer of the old songs. He sang at family gatherings and played in a local dance band. Before that, my grandfather was a genuine traditional singer who had a whole repertoire of family songs that had been passed down from generation to generation. They were all neatly handwritten in a notebook. I'm proud to say I continue to sing some of the family songs, but not just in our village. I've travelled all over the world and played in front of audiences of thousands. Speaker 2 I used to think tango is something only people of my parents' generation did, but then I went to a concert by the Gotan Project in London and I couldn't believe how exciting tango could be. For a start, the music was incredible. As well as the kind of instruments I was familiar with, you know, violins, guitars and piano, they used a bandonian. That's a sort of large, square-shaped accordion. But they also used electronic music, samples and beats. The rhythm was so infectious that some of the audience got up and bopped about, whether they could tango or not. Since then, I've joined a class and learned some of the basic moves. It's very exciting. Speaker 3 I'd be completely lost without my iPod, so I say thanks to whoever came up with the idea. I have it with me nearly all the time, whether I'm commuting to work, exercising at the local gym, trying to drown out some noise, or just chilling. I've got over 7,000 songs on mine, most of them downloads from the internet, some whole albums, but mostly individual tracks. I listen mainly to rock music, but I quite like jazz, and I even play classical stuff if I'm stressed. Mozart and other classical composers can be very relaxing if you're sitting on a crowded train or waiting at the dentist's or whatever. Speaker 4 I'm hoping to start a jazz band with a friend I studied music at university with. I play percussion and Ed plays trombone but our main interest is writing music. The band will have parts for 17 players. One of the difficulties is that most of the musicians we're approaching already play in other groups, so they won't be available all the time. We're planning to make a recording, but the logistics are a nightmare. Rehearsals and recording would be tricky, getting so many people into a studio at the same time. At the moment, it's just something we're looking into, but we're hoping it will become a reality sometime in the next year or so. Speaker 5 
I've just come back from WOMAD in Singapore. It was awesome. I went with a few friends and we got in for free because we were in the stage crew. We had to carry loads of stuff from one place to the next, but we still had time to get into the music. We got to talk to quite a lot of the acts. We got signatures and photos. It was a great experience, especially when the artists thank you for doing such a good job. I'd never heard of lots of the bands and singers before, but I'll be trying to catch them live whenever I can, until I go again next year. Unit 7. Speaking, Part 4. Exercise 3. Extract 1. No, not at all. I think it's really important for people who are going to be spending time together to get to know each other properly as quickly as possible. I don't have any experience of these activities myself, but I imagine if they're well thought out, they can be very worthwhile for the people who go on them, as well as for any clubs and organisations they belong to. There are probably a few individuals who can't see the point of them, and ironically, these may be the people who most need these activities, but I'd say the majority find them enjoyable and useful. What do you think, Marta? Well, I think I'd benefit from them personally, but not everyone would be comfortable with activities like these, and I don't think they should be forced to take part if they don't want to. Extract 2 I'd say it's easy for individuals to feel a bit lost in a large club, especially when they first join, and particularly if they don't already know anyone who belongs. In this situation, team-building activities provide opportunities for people to get to know each other better, more effectively than simply leaving things to chance, so that when they start joining in club activities, they feel more comfortable. That's not likely to be such a problem for members of smaller clubs, where everyone gets to know everyone else quite quickly. Do you agree, Laura? Yes, I do. I think in smaller organisations, people tend to get together socially and maybe don't need things organised for them. Unit 8. Listening. Part 3. Exercise 2. In today's On Message, I'm joined by Harry Cameron, the veteran journalist who has witnessed many changes in his profession over the last nearly 60 years. Harry, welcome. Thank you. Harry, can you tell me what being a journalist was like when you started as a junior reporter? My main memory of those far-off days is the sense of pride I felt at writing for a respected national newspaper. It was a real honour. What you have to remember is that in those days, people got most of their information about the world from their daily newspapers. Television was in its infancy, something only the rich could afford. The radio broadcast regular news bulletins, but newspapers gave people the pictures to go with the stories. Journalists like me travelled the world and filed reports which kept people up to date with everything important. I remember in the early 1950s reporting from a war zone in East Asia. I wrote my report in my hotel bedroom. I could hear gunfire and see plumes of smoke. I phoned the report through to my editor for publication a day or two later. I was reporting something thousands of miles from home, something the public didn't already know. But people still read newspapers today, don't they? Uh, yes, of course, but I believe the function of newspapers has changed. If you want to know what's going on in the world at any particular time, you don't read a newspaper, do you? You look on the internet or turn on the telly. <laughs> Whatever channel you're watching, there'll be regular news updates. So what can newspapers provide if not current news? Well, I suppose different newspapers provide different things, don't they? The broadsheets give us background to the news stories and an in-depth analysis of the issues involved. I think they do this very well. At the more popular end of the market, papers these days focus more and more on stories involving celebrities from the world of sport, TV, cinema, and, of course, sport itself. People lap all this up, and I suppose it is news of a kind.
And what about citizen journalism? Is this a term you're familiar with? Yes, it is. And it's something I have some sympathy with, even though it may put some of my own colleagues out of work in the long run. So how would you explain its sudden appearance as a source of information? It's quite simple. The fact is that the internet has given everyone access to a wealth of information and to a worldwide audience. So a citizen journalist in a war zone, like me all those years ago, doesn't have to write a story and send it to an editor who can decide whether or not to run the story in their newspaper. They can simply add information to a news website or write their own blog. Bloggers are the new journalists. And how reliable are bloggers and citizen journalists? At least as reliable as the traditional news providers, whose stories are usually revised and cut by editors who may be under political pressure from a newspaper owner or even their government. Some news websites allow other members of the public to add to, update or correct stories that are already there. It's a very democratic process. So this is not something you think should be controlled? Absolutely not. And, of course, you couldn't control it even if you wanted to. And you have no regrets about the effect of this form of journalism on the profession you were so proud to be part of when you first became a reporter? I suppose I'm a little sad. I mean, things will never be the same again. But the important thing is that people have reliable sources of up-to-date information. Of course, there will always be a role in newspapers and elsewhere for intelligent comment and analysis of the news. And if I were starting out again now, that's the kind of journalism I'd get into. And you do it extremely well, I have no doubt. Harry Cameron, thanks for being my guest today. It's been my pleasure. Unit 8. Grammar. Exercise 2. 1. Harry, can you tell me what being a journalist was like when you started? 2. My main memory of those far-off days is the sense of pride I felt at writing for a... 3. A journalists like me travelled the world and filed reports which kept people up to date with... 4. I wrote my report in my hotel bedroom. 5. Uh, yes, of course, but I believe the function of newspapers has changed. 6. I mean, things will never be the same again. Unit 8. Grammar. Exercise 4. 1. Have you ever used Wikipedia? Yes, I have. I used it yesterday. 2. How well do you know my sister? We're best friends. 3. What will you do after university? I'll probably work abroad. 4. What are you doing tomorrow? Taking my driving test. Unit 8. Speaking. Part 3. Exercise 3. They're all quite important influences, aren't they? But I'd say that nearly everyone watches television, so it's got to be a big influence on people. Mm, and the radio. There are loads of people who have the radio on all the time, whatever they're doing. Yeah, that's because it's pretty easy to do things at the same time as you're listening. Mm. TV's not like that, you know, you've got to watch it to make sense of it. The point is, does radio have as powerful an influence as the TV? No, probably not, but we're not supposed to be thinking about radio and TV separately, are we? No, I suppose not. I'd say things like the news on TV can have a greater influence because you can actually see what's happening. OK, now we've got newspapers. Hmm. I'd say quite a few people read this, but I think people tend to read the newspapers that agree with their political opinions. So, 
that probably don't actually change many people's ideas or opinions. That's true. Or if they just want amusement, sport and things like that, they read one of the tabloids. Okay, so on to uh, advertising. Advertising is just everywhere. Mm. You couldn't get away from it even if you wanted to. There's so much brand management now. It's all sort of subconscious. Companies sponsoring things and... Too much money spent on advertising. Mm. Do you think it has much effect on people? It must do. Or the companies wouldn't spend so much money on it, would they? I suppose not. But I'm not sure advertising affects me that much. I'm fairly sure I haven't bought anything because of an advert I've seen. <laughs> That's what you say, but are you sure? We've already agreed that advertising can affect you sort of subconsciously, so that you don't think you've been persuaded, but in fact you have. That's the problem. You can never be sure, can you? <laughs> okay, uh, let's move on to the internet, which is massive, isn't it? <laughs> In some countries, it must be the most influential of all these things. You can find out anything. Yeah, absolutely anything. Wikipedia and all the social networking sites and stuff. And at least with the internet, people have a huge choice. But don't forget all the banner ads and the pop-ups. Ah, you see, you can never get away from advertising of some kind. I know. <laughs> and almost all games people play online are packed with ads. In the end, multinational corporations are responsible for that. They're a lot more influential than we realize because their wealth gives them power. Yeah. But it's less direct power, isn't it? I don't think it's less direct. It may be less obvious, but there's no doubt that large sections of the media are owned and controlled by the business interests of a few powerful individuals. This means they influence people's political views and control advertising. So in the end, they do have a huge influence on how we spend our money. It's all a bit sinister, don't you think? Yeah, a bit Big Brotherish, being told what to think. Unit 8, Speaking, Part 3, Exercise 7. Now you have about a minute to decide which two of these influences have the greatest effect on people. I think we've more or less decided, haven't we? Mm, I'm not sure we have. I mean, we both think the internet is very powerful. But lots of internet sites are packed with advertising, and that's how multinational corporations make their money, isn't it? Yes, yeah, so what are we saying? That multinational corporations are the most powerful influence of all? Well, that's what I think. I'm not so sure. I'd say TV and radio are pretty powerful too. Yes, but a lot of broadcasting stations are funded by advertising, aren't they? Yes, I never thought of that. OK, so we think that multinational corporations are the most powerful. What's next? Well, I'd say advertising, because that's everywhere. In newspapers, on the internet and on TV. So, do we agree? Yes, I think we do. <laughs> Unit 9. Listening, Part 1. Exercise 2. Extract 1. Yes, well, of course, when the steam train was invented, it completely changed 19th century society, didn't it? Yes, it was a tremendous change. People's entire worldview underwent a profound transformation. There were things we find laughable today, such as the fear that the vibration would shatter passengers' skeletons. <laughs> and over the next hundred years, railways had a radical impact on the countryside, making it possible to live there and commute to work in cities. Outlying villages, which had been quiet, sleepy places before trains arrived, became busy suburbs. That's right. And humans underwent a sudden evolution from being comparatively slow and clumsy to becoming the fastest living creatures. This had a subtle but distinct effect in the following years on the way people regarded their place in the world. They began to believe they were no longer totally at the mercy of natural events, but that they were somehow above them and could take action to harness these phenomena. I doubt if any other invention has had such a profound influence on the human psyche. 19th century literature and art's full of it. 
and early steam trains were to blame for some quite horrific accidents. Yes, well, of course, when the steam train was invented, it completely changed 19th century society, didn't it? Yes, it was a tremendous change. People's entire worldview underwent a profound transformation. There were things we find laughable today, such as the fear that the vibration would shatter passengers' skeletons. <laughs> and over the next hundred years, railways had a radical impact on the countryside, making it possible to live there and commute to work in cities. Outlying villages, which had been quiet, sleepy places before trains arrived, became busy suburbs. That's right. And humans underwent a sudden evolution from being comparatively slow and clumsy to becoming the fastest living creatures. This had a subtle but distinct effect in the following years on the way people regarded their place in the world. They began to believe they were no longer totally at the mercy of natural events, but that they were somehow above them and could take action to harness these phenomena. I doubt if any other invention has had such a profound influence on the human psyche. 19th century literature and art's full of it. And early steam trains were to blame for some quite horrific accidents. Unit 9. Listening, Part 1. Exercise 5. Extract 2. Do you think people will lose interest in Olympic events when athletes no longer break records? Well, they're only just managing to now. Previously, when they broke records, their feats were often mind-blowing. Take Bob Beamon's long jump record in 1968, 55 centimetres longer than the previous record. I can't imagine anyone making such a difference nowadays. Yeah, but there will always be some individuals who manage to grab the headlines. Maybe, but they'll be relatively few and far between. And newspapers and TV will always blow them out of proportion when they occur because they need a sensation. Mm, well, I think breaking a record even by a millisecond is a sensation. But I guess we're getting close to the limits of human ability now. Maybe. The key change occurred when top sports people stopped being amateurs and devoted themselves full-time to their sport, not to mention new technologies which affected shoe or track design. Perhaps the next big step could be to modify human genes to produce better athletes. Yeah, that used to sound like science fiction, didn't it? But if they can do it to rats, they'll soon be able to do it to humans too. Ha! <laughs> Rat Olympics! Do you think people will lose interest in Olympic events when athletes no longer break records? Well, they're only just managing to now. Previously, when they broke records, their feats were often mind-blowing. Take Bob Beamon's long jump record in 1968, 55 centimetres longer than the previous record. I can't imagine anyone making such a difference nowadays. Yeah, but there will always be some individuals who manage to grab the headlines. Maybe, but they'll be relatively few and far between. And newspapers and TV will always blow them out of proportion when they occur because they need a sensation. Mm, well, I think breaking a record even by a millisecond is a sensation. But I guess we're getting close to the limits of human ability now. Maybe. The key change occurred when top sports people stopped being amateurs and devoted themselves full-time to their sport, not to mention new technologies which affected shoe or track design. Perhaps the next big step could be to modify human genes to produce better athletes. Yeah, that used to sound like science fiction, didn't it? But if they can do it to rats, they'll soon be able to do it to humans too. Ha! <laughs> Rat Olympics! Unit 9. Listening, Part 1. Exercise 8. Extract 3. When you think that the nearest stars 4.2 light-years away, a spaceship using current technology would take 72,000 years to get there, an unimaginable length of time. So to make interstellar space travel a realistic possibility, the spaceship would need a nuclear explosion to propel it at close to the speed of light. Well, that may be technically feasible, but there are treaties which prohibit nuclear explosions from being used in space programmes. Who knows what effects such explosions might have on the environment? 
True, but a spaceship using more conventional technology would take so long to get anywhere that the original occupants wouldn't live to reach their destination. Nor would their great-grandchildren, but only their descendants many generations later would. Even if there were a couple of hundred people prepared to embark on a journey like this, they and their descendants would have to live together on the ship all their lives, travelling through the emptiness of space. What activities would they engage in during all this time? What would be the point of their existence? That really would be the central concern. I can imagine them degenerating into barbarism and fighting after they've spent several generations in space. What a horrific thought! When you think that the nearest stars 4.2 light-years away, a spaceship using current technology would take 72,000 years to get there, an unimaginable length of time. So to make interstellar space travel a realistic possibility, the spaceship would need a nuclear explosion to propel it at close to the speed of light. Well, that may be technically feasible, but there are treaties which prohibit nuclear explosions from being used in space programmes. Who knows what effects such explosions might have on the environment? True, but a spaceship using more conventional technology would take so long to get anywhere that the original occupants wouldn't live to reach their destination. Nor would their great-grandchildren, but only their descendants many generations later would. Even if there were a couple of hundred people prepared to embark on a journey like this, they and their descendants would have to live together on the ship all their lives travelling through the emptiness of space. What activities would they engage in during all this time? What would be the point of their existence? That really would be the central concern. I can imagine them degenerating into barbarism and fighting after they've spent several generations in space. What a horrific thought! Unit 9. Speaking Part 2. Exercise 3. Now, in this part of the test, I'm going to give each of you three pictures. I'd like you to talk about two of them on your own for about a minute, and also to answer a question briefly about your partner's pictures. Anna, it's your turn first. Here are your pictures. They show people using different machines or devices. I'd like you to compare two of the pictures and say what problems the people might have in their jobs and how the machines or devices might help the people to do their jobs better. Well, uh, the first one is a policeman using what I think must be a tablet, you know, with an internet connection so he can check or send data. He's probably checking the identity of a driver to see if he has a criminal record or he could be checking to see if the car is stolen or something. The other picture shows, oh, what do you call the person? A cowboy or a shepherd, I'm not sure. And he's rounding up his herd, I mean, his flock of sheep. I think the policeman might have problems with angry drivers he's giving a fine to or if he's dealing with traffic offences. The device helps him because he can check information in, uh, what's the phrase, in real time. He doesn't have to call someone at the police station or go there to check things. He might even have a mobile printer in the police car and be able to give the driver a fine automatically. The shepherd might have trouble finding all his sheep and protecting them from predators. Also, he has to cover a large area. By using a, a, I'm not sure of the name of the vehicle, is it a quad bike? He doesn't have to walk or use a horse all day so he can conserve his energy and not get worn out and so can his dog. Thank you. Danielle, which job do you think is the most demanding? Hmm, good question. For me, I think the most demanding job is probably the shepherd. I mean, how do you keep track of all those sheep and not lose one? <laughs> and you're out there working whatever the weather. Now, Danielle, here are your pictures. Unit 9. Speaking, Part 2. Exercise 7. Set A. Now, in this part of the test, I'm going to give each of you three pictures. 
I'd like you to talk about two of them on your own for about a minute, and also to answer a question briefly about your partner's pictures. Here are your pictures. They show people doing activities in remote environments. I'd like you to compare two of the pictures and say why the people might have chosen to do these activities in these remote places, and what the dangers of doing each of them might be. Unit 9. Speaking, Part 2. Exercise 7. Set B. Now, in this part of the test, I'm going to give each of you three pictures. I'd like you to talk about two of them on your own for about a minute, and also to answer a question briefly about your partner's pictures. Here are your pictures. They show people doing things in a traditional way, instead of using a machine. I'd like you to compare two of the pictures and say why the people might be doing these activities in a traditional way and how difficult it might be to do these activities. Unit 10. Listening, Part 2. Exercise 3. Three friends and I have come here for an Arabic course at the Advanced Language Centre as part of our degree at London University. In our first year, we were offered the choice of several modern languages. Persian, Turkish and Arabic were available, but I was charmed by the Arabic lecturer, who had a huge smile and a passion for his subject. As the course developed, so did my fascination with Arabic, its different alphabet and the culture. I researched the possibility of studying in a Middle Eastern country. In the end, I decided this was the best place. The city has a lively cultural scene, and its colloquial dialect is the most widely understood throughout the Arab world. We arrived in September and got to our hotel at about 10pm. Unfortunately, the staff were nervous about letting us stay, as we were a mixed group who were all unmarried. We eventually found another hotel, where we haggled over the price of rooms. We spent the next few days settling in and getting to know the city. Then our course leader arranged flats for us to look around. We chose a light, spacious flat with a friendly and helpful landlady. It's much better than I was used to in London. It was a fascinating time for us, but the culture shock was so great that within the first week, one of our group returned home. The area around our language centre is crowded with shops and cafes, where people sit and drink tea. We usually have lunch at the centre, small flatbreads stuffed with falafel or beans, or large circular pieces of bread, filled with strips of beef and pieces of cheese. We have two teachers. Rania is a young woman who wears a hijab that always matches her jeans. In her lessons we learn how to greet, congratulate and explain why we are studying here. Ingi dresses in a more western style. Jeans, short sleeves, no hijab. With her we do role plays. We shop for groceries and other everyday items and we also arrange visits to places of interest. It's Ramadan at the moment but the teachers seem relatively unaffected by it. They teach for four and a half hours a day, Sunday to Thursday, with no food or water from sunrise until sunset. One of the most difficult challenges in learning Arabic is that to us there seems to be no connection between the written and the spoken forms. Quite apart from the different script, the written form of the language has no vowels, making some words very difficult to understand. Also, pronunciation is very tricky, because lots of Arabic sounds are made at the back of the throat, something that I find really difficult and, to be honest, a bit embarrassing. At weekends, we relax at the country club, membership costs £10 a month, and lie by the pool, where the dress rules are more relaxed. In the evenings, we sit in cafes by the sea and smoke apple shisha. Soon the crescent moon will signal the end of Ramadan, and the country will show us another face. Unit 10. Speaking, Part 4. Exercise 4. I'd say probably older students, for the simple reason that they're more able to work independently than younger students. This kind of learning only works if students are motivated and interested. 
For this reason, it works more effectively when students work in pairs or groups. Members of the group can decide what needs to be done and share out the different tasks. Later, they can get back together to report the results of their efforts. I would say that anyone below secondary school age would find this difficult to do successfully. I agree with most of what you say, but I think we should introduce children to this kind of work while they're still in primary school, just to get them used to the idea of managing their own learning. Of course, teachers need to make sure they prepare their students well. That means giving very clear instructions to make sure students know what they're supposed to be doing. I think the main advantage is that students get a program of study which is specifically designed for them. This approach lets the teacher focus on specific problems or difficulties that the individual student has, as well as adopting a learning style which suits that student. In most class teaching situations, teachers have to cater for a wide range of abilities and learning styles. I don't disagree with that, but I think you're only looking at one aspect of education and learning. When students are in classes, they're not just absorbing information. They're learning to get on with other people. Some people would say that this is at least as important as academic study. Unit 11. Listening Part 1. Exercise 3. Extract 1. It'll be getting dark soon, won't it? What about over there? That looks quite a good place to stop and camp for the night, doesn't it? Maybe. Very peaceful. Don't count on it. If I'd known about the mosquitoes, I'd never have signed up for this. But none of that would matter if, you know, there were rapids, white water, crocodiles and panoramic landscapes. I mean, we're just getting bitten on a muddy river closed in by dull, monotonous little trees. It's not as if we had to come here. There were lots of other places we could have gone if only we'd realised. Oh, Don, if only you'd put on some repellent. And if you'd please just stop moaning for a while, perhaps we could start enjoying ourselves a bit. Just think what a lovely change this is from city life. Some change. Even if we stayed at home, it'd be better because I'd be relaxing in front of the telly right now, instead of paddling up this miserable river. Don! It'll be getting dark soon, won't it? What about over there? That looks quite a good place to stop and camp for the night, doesn't it? Maybe. Very, very peaceful. Don't count on it. If I'd known about the mosquitoes, I'd never have signed up for this. But none of that would matter if, you know, no, there were rapids, white water, crocodiles and panoramic landscapes. I mean, we're just getting bitten on a muddy river closed in by dull, monotonous little trees. It's not as if we had to come here. There were lots of other places we could have gone if only we'd realised. Oh, Don, if only you'd put on some repellent. If you'd please just stop moaning for a while, perhaps we could start enjoying ourselves a bit. Just think what a lovely change this is from city life. So, some change. Even if we stayed at home, it'd be better, because I'd be relaxing in front of the telly right now, instead of paddling up this miserable river. Don! Extract 2 So, what'll we do if the weather breaks? Do you think we'll have to call, call it a day? Call it a day? No, no way. Not after all the hassle we've had to get this far. All the money we're raising and all those people we'd be letting down. Look, we're taking all the right equipment. Wet weather gear, good boots. You really can't ask for more. Anyway, we've committed ourselves to this thing, so we've got to go through with it. Look, if things start looking really bad, we can always put the walk off for a while and set off a bit later. OK, but we were warned about this, you remember. Northwest Spain can be pretty icy at this time of year. Of course, but that's all part of it, isn't it? And if we don't do it, we'll never live it down. I'm sure we'll make it. I mean, our names will be dirt if we don't. That's a good point. 
And I guess they'd pay up anyway, even if we didn't make it, wouldn't they? Hopefully. And anyway, a little hardship never did anyone any harm. So, what'll we do if the weather breaks? Do you think we'll have to call it a day? Call it a day? No way. Not after all the hassle we've had to get this far. All the money we're raising, and all those people we'd be letting down. Look, we're taking all the right equipment. Wet weather gear, good boots. You really can't ask for more. Anyway, we've committed ourselves to this thing, so we've got to go through with it. Look, if things start looking really bad, we can always put the walk off for a while and set off a bit later. OK, but we were warned about this, you remember? Northwest Spain can be pretty icy at this time of year. Of course, but that's all part of it, isn't it? And if we don't do it, we'll never live it down. I'm sure we'll make it. I mean, our names will be dirt if we don't. That's a good point. And I guess they'd pay up anyway, even if we didn't make it, wouldn't they? Hopefully. And anyway, a little hardship never did anyone any harm. Extract 3 So, you managed to get off the beaten tourist track during your trip too, Kate. That's right, and like you, to places which are really for the more intrepid traveller. <laughs> right. It's a good idea for people going there on their own to do a bit of advanced planning, but not too much, because I think if you leave yourself open to whatever comes up, it can be very rewarding. Of course, you'll form all sorts of opinions about what you see, more or less, on the spur of the moment, but that doesn't matter, because if you're open-minded about things, you'll soon discover you are mistaken about a lot of them. And you have to take the rough with the smooth. You can't expect it to be all plain sailing when you're travelling to oases and places like that. I agree, and I really appreciated sharing buses and ferries with all sorts of interesting people. You and a lot about the country just from chatting to them. It could all have been dull otherwise, you know, wait, waiting for transport in, in villas and so on. At times, I felt I wanted the journey to go on forever. It wasn't all delightful, but there was something unexpected round every corner. That's right. So, so you managed to get off the beaten tourist track during your trip too, Kate. That's, that's right. right. And like you, to places which are really for the more intrepid traveller. <laughs> right. It's a good idea for people going there on their own to do a bit of advanced planning, but not too much, because I think if you leave yourself open to whatever comes up, it can be, can be very rewarding. Of course, you'll form all sorts of opinions about what you see, more or less, on the spur of the moment, but that doesn't matter, because if you're open-minded about things, you'll soon discover you are mistaken about a lot of them. And you have to take the rough with the smooth. You can't expect it to be all plain sailing when you're travelling to oases and places like that. I agree, and I really appreciated sharing buses and ferries with all sorts of interesting people. You know, I learned a lot about the country just from chatting to them. It could all have been quite dull otherwise, you know, waiting for transport in villages and so on. At times, I felt I wanted the journey to go on forever. It wasn't all delightful, but there was something unexpected round every corner. That's right. Unit 11. Speaking, Part 1. Exercise 2. Laura. Well, it depends where to. I'm certainly not afraid of taking risks for a bit of excitement, and I get a real buzz from a bit of danger. But it would have to be a journey to somewhere interesting, Somewhere that was worth visiting. I wouldn't want to do it just for the excitement. Danielle. Well, it certainly helps with the day-to-day -day problems like buying tickets, getting information and so on. But I'd say it's generally better to try to speak the local language if you can, because then you can get to know people, talk to them on their own terms, and that's when real communication starts happening. On the other hand, you can't learn the language of every country you want to visit, and in those cases, English is definitely better than nothing. Marta. 
Normally, I go to Croatia and the Adriatic Sea for a couple of weeks in the summer, which is wonderful. It's such a lovely area, but the chance to go even further afield and have some completely different experiences, well, for example, to spend two or three months traveling around Africa would be fabulous. It'd be great to see some of those places you only normally see on television. For example, the Ongorogoro Crater or the Kruger National Park. I'd really love that. It'd be the chance of a lifetime. Unit 12. Listening Part 2. Exercise 3. The Inuit, or Eskimo people, live in the Arctic and sub-Arctic regions of Siberia, Greenland and Canada. Altogether, there are more than 100,000 Inuit, most of whom live near the sea, hunting aquatic mammals such as seals, walruses and whales. European whalers, who arrived in the latter part of the 19th century, had a great impact on the Inuit. They brought their religion, but they also brought their infectious diseases. Diseases to which the Inuit had no immunity, and which, as a direct consequence of this, reduce the population in some areas. In the past, the Inuit had several different forms of traditional housing. In Greenland, they often lived in permanent stone houses. Along the shores of Siberia, they lived in villages made up of wooden houses. Summer housing for many Inuit was a skin tent, while in the winter, Igloos, houses made of snow, were common. Wherever they live today, the Inuit are involved in the modern world. They have wholeheartedly adopted much of its technology, as well as its clothing and the design of their living spaces. Their economic, religious and governmental institutions have also been heavily influenced by the cultures of their near neighbours in Europe and America. Unit 12. Listening Part 2. Exercise 4. Today I'm going to be looking at some of the ways in which climate change is affecting the life and culture of the Inuit people. I suppose it would be true to say that, in today's world, most educated adults are aware of global warming and climate change. But how many of us living in modern cities, cities with a seemingly inexhaustible supply of electricity into our homes and places of work, how many of us are actually affected by these phenomena in our daily lives? The Inuit, however, are being affected in a very real way on a daily basis by a frightening deterioration in their physical surroundings. They see melting ice sheets, changing tides, and notice the thinning of the polar bear population. They see how the daily weather markers on which they've relied for thousands of years are becoming less predictable as their fragile climate changes. In the past, if there was a ring around the moon, it meant a change of weather in the next few days. Now, such signs mean nothing. But these are just the most immediately visible indications of the changes taking place. Talk to the Inuit elders and hunters who depend on the land and you'll hear disturbing accounts of deformed fish, diseased caribou and baby seals left by their mothers to starve. In the last year or so, robins have appeared where robins have never been seen before. Interestingly, there's no word for robin in the Inuit language. These ideas are not simply based on what the Inuit themselves have observed, there's increasingly strong scientific evidence that the Arctic, this desert of snow, ice and killing cold wind, is thawing. Glaciers are receding, coastlines are receding, and other large bodies of fresh water are no longer there. Autumn freezes are coming later, and the winters are not as cold. For years, what the Inuit elders and hunters understood about the Arctic climate, known as traditional knowledge, was largely disregarded by the Western world. It was often dismissed as anecdotal and unreliable by scientists who visited the area with their recording devices and their theories. Some even viewed the Inuit as ignorant about a land which they've inhabited for thousands of years. 
But, more recently, scientists have begun paying attention to what the Inuit are reporting. According to geophysicist George Hobson, traditional Inuit knowledge was just waiting to be passed down. He says this deep understanding of the land and its wildlife have enabled the Inuit people to survive in the harsh Arctic environment. For thousands of years, the Inuit have lived by rules that require them to respect animals and the land. They've adapted to the cold climate as they hunted seals, walruses and whales. Siloa Atagujuk, an elderly Inuit woman who lives in the city of Iqaluit, doesn't want to pretend she knows more than anyone else. Nor does she try to blame anyone for the change in her environment. She's simply worried. Her world is not as it used to be, and her people may not have the capacity to adapt to it. She says that the Inuit have known all along that there'd be a time when the Earth would be destroyed or would destroy itself. She believes that this process has begun. Unit 12. Speaking, Part 3. Exercise 4. Now, I'd like you to talk about something together for about two minutes. Here are some environmental threats that can affect people's lives. Talk to each other about how these threats can affect people's lives. Well, this one's really relevant at the moment because it's in the news now, literally, as we speak. Mm. There are lots of forest fires all over Australia and they're having a terrible effect on people's lives. The experts seem to think it's one of the results of climate change and global warming. Yes, but forest fires only affect certain parts of the world, don't they? I mean, I'd say flooding is probably more widespread. It affects more different places, uh, Asia, America and Europe. They say that's also connected with global warming, don't they? Yes, and that's only going to get worse if the ice caps continue melting at the current rate. And flooding can cause terrible damage, at least as bad as fires. Mm, and the opposite, drought, of course. In some ways, that's worse than floods because more people are affected. Droughts often lead to poor harvests, which means people have no food and have to travel for days, often on foot, to refugee camps where they're given food. But their lives can be ruined. That used to be just in Africa, didn't it? I think it's now beginning to happen in parts of southern Europe. I remember a few years ago when all those people died in a heat wave in France. Mm, I'm not sure that was quite like the situation in Africa, but drought and flooding are definitely more common than they used to be. And that's really worrying. And what about pollution as well, especially air pollution, which seems to be on the minds of many people at the moment? I'm sure that's going to affect us, perhaps more in the long term than now. Do you think so? It already does affect us, doesn't it? I mean, think about how many more people there are now with allergies and breathing problems than there used to be. Mm, very true. And finally, there's fossil fuel consumption. Do you think that's really a threat? Yes, I do. In two different ways. When we burn fossil fuels like coal and oil to make energy, that causes air pollution, doesn't it? And secondly, if the price of oil goes on rising, this will damage the world economy and that will probably lead to all kinds of political tensions, perhaps even wars. Mm. Who knows? Thank you. Unit 12. Speaking, Part 3. Exercise 5. Thank you. Now you have about a minute to decide which of the problems poses the greatest threat to us. Which one of these five do we think is going to be the biggest threat? It's very difficult to say, isn't it? They all pose terrible dangers, but perhaps the time scale is different. What do you mean? Well, they all affect us now, but in the future some will get worse and some will improve. Do you think so? Yes, I do. For example, in the short term, I think fossil fuel consumption poses the greatest threat because it affects us now. But eventually, we'll run out of fossil fuels, which means that in the future, we won't be able to consume them. By that time, of course, the other threats like air pollution, fires, flooding and droughts will be worse because of increases in global warming. You could be right. 
So what are we going to decide? Personally, I think drought is going to pose the greatest threat, especially if the population of the world goes on growing. Mm, uh, yes, I think I agree. If harvests fail, millions of people can starve to death, whereas at least in the case of forest fires and flooding, people usually escape, even though their lives may be changed forever. Okay, let's say we think that drought poses the greatest long-term threat. Unit 13. Listening, Part 3. Exercise 3. These days we're all too familiar with the word allergy and phrases like I'm allergic to pollen or eggs or cats. And it's generally accepted that allergies are more widespread in the population than in the past. Is this because the subject is getting increased exposure in the media or are we really becoming less able to protect ourselves against those substances which cause allergies? These are just some of the questions we'll be tackling in today's phone-in programme. In the studio today is allergy specialist Dr Mohamed Bawadi to answer your questions. Welcome, Dr Bawadi. Thank you. I should start by saying that the medical profession takes allergies very seriously and we recognise that severe allergies can be a cause of great anxiety for some individuals. OK, thank you. Our first caller today is Tim from Edinburgh. Tim, what's your question? Hi. Right, well, I'm a hay fever sufferer. I'm very allergic to pollen from grass and certain trees, especially in the spring. What I don't understand is that my allergy didn't begin until I was in my mid-thirties. I'd really like to know why it appeared so late. And am I stuck with it now? Dr Bawadi? Hello, Tim. Uh, your story is a very common one. The fact is that allergies don't discriminate. They're no more likely to affect children than old people. I'm afraid they can develop at any time of life, from birth to 60 and beyond. This is because an allergy is a mistaken response of our immune system to a harmless substance. As to whether you're stuck with your allergy, that's a less straightforward question. The best way to treat any allergy is to avoid contact with whatever causes the allergic reaction. Someone who was allergic to eggs would find it fairly easy to avoid eating anything containing eggs, whereas you would find it impossible to avoid all contact with pollen unless you lived in a desert or a coastal area. And I'd add, Tim, that there's now research evidence from around the world that the most common age to develop an allergy is in your late teens, so you've not done too badly. Our next caller is Arabella from Amsterdam in the Netherlands. What's your question, Arabella? Hello, I'm allergic to peanuts, so of course I have to be really careful about foods which contain even the smallest traces of peanuts. But what I'd like to know is whether I'm likely to pass this allergy on to any children I may have in the future. Thank you. Dr Bawadi? Hello, Arabella. This is an interesting question. In developed countries, all children have a 12% risk of developing an allergy. In the case of your child, this would rise to 20%. However, if the child's father also had an allergy of some kind, this risk would increase to 40%. So what about if the father and the mother have the same allergy? Then I'm afraid there's a 70% chance that the child will develop that allergy. Thank you, Arabella. I hope that answers your question. Just before we move on to the next caller, can I ask you whether we are in fact seeing a higher incidence of allergies in the population than in the past? We most certainly are. Even though we're getting better at diagnosing and treating some allergies, there's a year-on-year -year increase in the number of patients visiting their doctor with asthma and the wide range of food allergies. Recent research has shown that in Britain and the USA, between 20 and 30 percent of the population suffer from some kind of allergy. Why is this happening? Well, it's a complex problem. There are many theories about why more people are affected by allergies. Certain aspects of modern living are blamed by some experts. Uh, for example, widespread use of air conditioning and central heating 
combined with the fact that more of us now work in offices, is thought to have led to a significant increase in allergic reactions to dust and mould. Vehicle exhaust fumes are widely regarded as the main factor responsible for the increase in asthma in the under fives. You only have to walk through the streets of a large modern city to understand the strength of that argument. On the other hand, some experts believe that in this modern age we're obsessed with cleanliness, while others believe that vaccinations to protect our children from certain diseases may actually weaken their immune system and so make them less resistant to allergens. Thank you. That's very interesting. Let's move on. We have several people waiting on the phone in line. Let's speak to... Unit 13. Speaking, Part 2. Exercise 5. Set A. OK, I'm going to choose gym exercises and walking. I think because they seem to me to be quite different. I think gym exercises are becoming more and more popular because people don't have the opportunity to go out into the countryside, especially if they live in a town. So lots of people join a gym because they think that's a good way to keep fit. I think it's to do with time and space and not having the opportunity to walk, whereas walking is something you can do only if you have access to the countryside, which a lot of people don't have these days. Anyone can join a gym and plan their visits to fit in with their other commitments. Personally, I prefer walking to gym exercises, which I think are dreadfully boring. Walking's more interesting because you get to see the countryside. Set B. The three photographs here show very demanding activities. Perhaps the most physically demanding would be either rowing or cycling because you're exercising more parts of the body. But then again, for rock climbing, you need a certain level of physical fitness. Um, I've never actually been rock climbing myself, but I know someone who does it regularly and he's very fit. Um, I suppose if I had to choose one activity to help me keep fit, it'd have to be rowing, I think, because it works the muscles in almost every part of your body, especially your arms, legs, back and stomach. I did it a couple of times when I was a kid, and I remember it was absolutely exhausting. <laughs> Cycling, on the other hand, is an everyday activity you can do at any time and you don't need anywhere special to do it. Unit 14. Starting off. Exercise 2. 1. I've been here now for about 15 years. It's a good life, though I work hard. But frankly, I miss my country and the town where I grew up and dream of going back. I feel special ties to the place, and when I retire, I hope to return there to be among my friends and my family. 2. We were utterly fed up with the crime and feeling of insecurity that surrounded us, and it was precisely for that reason that we moved away. What really worried us was the effect it might have on the kids going to the local school. We felt it just wasn't worth the risk. On the other hand, it hasn't been easy coping with the language barrier, I have to admit, at least not for us parents. The kids integrated straight away, of course. 3. I haven't changed countries, but I've moved from the country to the city because it has better services and more opportunities. I was absolutely astonished to find that many people looked down on me when I first arrived, which didn't exactly make things easy. I suppose they thought, oh, here's some country bumpkin come to the city to make good. And I guess they were right, because I have. 4. I love lots of things about my country. The food, the sense of humour, the newspapers, lots of things. Actually, I have to admit it was the climate I couldn't stand any longer. 
I just found the short grey days and the continual rain totally depressing. Mind you, the heat's sometimes a problem here and then I dream of going home. But that's only the odd day here and there. Mostly it's fine. 5. I guess you could call me a rolling stone, if people still use that expression. I mean, I've been abroad for so long, I don't know all the latest slang. <laughs> you see, unfortunately, I'm one of those typical expatriates who spends two years working in this country and three years working in that. I don't think I could ever go back to my home country, because quite honestly, I just wouldn't fit in. I'd be completely out of touch. 6. As a professional ballet dancer, there's just no way I could have stayed in my hometown. Obviously, you have to be prepared to move abroad if you want to get to the top, and there's no point in being in this business unless that's your aim. I've been incredibly lucky, though, and I think everyone needs luck. Unit 14. Listening, Part 4. Exercise 2. Speaker 1. I was watching this really interesting programme the other day about people who'd come over here to work and had originally meant to stay just a couple of years, but then ended up meeting someone and settling down and things. I thought it was quite remarkable, actually, because we give the impression of being rather a nationalistic lot, but that doesn't seem to be the case at all, in fact. The camera went into people's houses and showed us how they'd been accepted by their new family who were adopting all sorts of new customs and behaviours you wouldn't expect. What impressed me most was seeing their new in-laws learning how to cook new dishes. It was fascinating, a real eye-opener. Speaker 2 I go to dance classes every Thursday evening. Anyway, there's a student there, quite a young woman, who has only just recently come to this country, and the other day she was really looking dead tired, so I offered to get her a coffee afterwards, and we got talking. Anyway, I found out that she's working here as a nurse to support her family back home. They've stayed behind, you see. Apparently, there are lots of other people in the same situation as her. Her salary here is enough to provide their schooling, their clothing and all sorts of other things back home. But she's doing incredibly long hours. It's being away from your children and family that must be the worst thing. I think I'd find that unbearable. Speaker 3 My daughter goes to school with this girl, Mariska. Her family's just arrived here. They sit together in class, they're friends and we've got to know the parents a bit. Anyway, they've only been here what seems like a couple of months or so, but they've already set up a travel agency for people thinking of visiting their region. They've got all these local contacts, which is a bit of an advantage, I suppose, but they're already doing so well that they've even been able to give jobs to a couple of locals as well. I think that's absolutely amazing, don't you? Speaker 4 Don't get me wrong. As far as I'm concerned, immigration's fine. In fact, I think it's really necessary, considering the skill shortage we've got here. But what we've ended up with is quite a cultural mix in our office, and that means it's sometimes quite hard for people to get their ideas across and, you know, sort of marry up their different approaches to work. I'm continually surprised by the sheer variety of different takes on a situation and the different expectations people have. Personally, I think this sort of intercultural mix is one of the biggest challenges at work today. Speaker 5 When I started, everyone was born here and spoke the same language. Now it's a real melting pot, and that gives rise to no end of problems. But you have to be flexible and turn these things to your advantage. And having kids of five or ten different ethnic backgrounds learning together is a culturally enriching experience for everyone, including me. You have to see the kids from abroad. It's their ability to work hard that absolutely amazes me. And it's actually pressuring our local kids to put in more of an effort themselves, too. They're getting better results now, which is just the opposite of what I'd have expected, and quite a challenge to my preconceptions. Unit 14. 
Speaking Part 4 Exercise 3 Laura, what do you think are the benefits of a multicultural society? I think it encourages understanding of other cultures and tolerance towards them and towards other ways of life, other religions perhaps, and that can be very educational. I think it can open up people's minds to experiences that they might not be able to have otherwise. And Danielle, do you agree with Laura? Yes, and also I personally think it can make society itself richer by having diversity within it. And lots of people from different backgrounds, with different outlooks, different ways of doing things and different cultural experiences. Laura, should people who go to live in another country adopt the culture of the country where they go to live? That's a contentious issue. Not necessarily. It's possible for different cultures to live side by side. And I think with most cultures, there's a certain overlap of similarity. And I think people should be allowed to have some of the elements of their own culture, as long as they're not detrimental to the good of the majority. Danielle, what do you think? Well, I'd go along with that. I think it's a question of sensitivity. It's unreasonable for immigrants to give up all aspects of their culture, but they do need to be sensitive towards the culture and the people in the country where they are choosing to live. And, Danielle, how can governments help immigrants? What they need to do is provide lots of information at the beginning so that people can make the transition to a new society. Housing something I think they should be providing, so they're covering people's basic needs to help them integrate as quickly as possible. Also, I think there should be offers of tuition in the new language, tuition about the new culture, possibly. I don't know if that should be compulsory, but at least it should be on offer. Unit 14. Speaking Part 4. Exercise 4. 1. I think it can open up people's minds to experiences that they might not be able to have otherwise. 2. I personally think it can make society itself richer by having diversity within it. 3. And I think people should be allowed to have some of the elements of their own culture, as long as they're not detrimental to the good of the majority. 4. What they need to do is provide lots of information at the beginning so that people can make the transition to a new society. 5. Housing something I think they should be providing. Unit 1. Listening. Part 4. You'll hear five short extracts in which people are talking about their friends. Look at task 1. For questions 1 to 5, choose from the list A to H how each speaker originally met their friend. Now look at task 2. For questions 6 to 10, choose from the list A to H the quality each speaker's friend has. While you listen, you must complete both tasks. Speaker 1 I moved to an apartment in New York where I didn't know anyone, but I started to make friends at work. One evening, when I was really tired, there was incredibly loud music coming from the apartment downstairs, so I went and asked for it to be turned down. The next day, there was a note through the door from Mark saying he hoped he hadn't spoiled my evening. And that's the great thing about him. He always acknowledges if he's in the wrong. Anyway, we discovered we both love basketball, and we started practicing together. We became firm friends and still see each other, although we have less time for basketball these days. Speaker 2 when I was 13, my dad said his new boss had a daughter of my age who he was sure I would get on with. They'd just moved and she'd started a new school and didn't know anyone in the area. 
Of course, when we did get together, we didn't get along. I was quite reserved and Alessia was full of herself. Later, when we were grown up, we met again through friends and this time we hit it off. Now I appreciate the fact that life's never dull when she's around, as there's always some project she's just getting started on and is excited about. It's true that opposites attract, but you don't always realise it when you're young. Speaker 3 I sometimes wonder where I'd be without Johnny, who always seems to be around to cheer me up when there's a crisis. He doesn't say much, and he doesn't want to hear anyone's problems, but nothing ever seems to get him down, and that's a great bonus in a friend. It was always like that. Before going to university, I spent three months cleaning offices, and I had to be there by five in the morning. Johnny was always on the same bus as me as he was working in a bakery. By the time I got to work, we'd shared a few jokes and I was starting to feel human and ready to start my day. Speaker 4 I've got myself into deep trouble sometimes because I do love to gossip. I can't stop myself. Most other people can't bear to keep things to themselves either, but Anna is different. If you do tell her something in confidence, you know it won't go any further. She lives very near me now, but she used to live in Thailand. A few years ago, I was travelling round Southeast Asia on buses, and my friend arranged for me to stay with Anna, who she'd met at university. As soon as I met her, I knew she'd be a lot of fun. She's quite a bit older than me, but it doesn't seem to matter. Speaker 5 One day I was queuing to go into a football match, and I started talking to this guy next to me, who was Tom. To cut a long story short, we ended up in the same band and shared a flat for a while. For a bit, I stopped seeing my other friends, and I got very arrogant because we were doing well. To be honest, I wasn't a nice person to be around. But Tom just took me for who I was, and he still does. He doesn't feel the right to tell other people how to live their lives, unlike some other people who think only their way is best. Unit 2. Listening. Part 3. You'll hear an interview in which an Irish-Australian writer called Patrick O'Reilly is talking about the Irish Gaelic language. For questions 1 to 6, choose the answer A, B, C or D, which fits best according to what you hear. Good evening, everyone. With me in the studio today is Patrick O'Reilly, a third-generation Irish-Australian who is a writer and broadcaster and passionate supporter of the Irish Gaelic language. Welcome, Patrick. Thank you, Sinead. Tell me, Patrick, what significance does Irish have for you? Well, as you said, I'm an Irish-Australian. Irish is my second language. I didn't learn it in Ireland, but here in Australia... In the 18th century, it was the first language of many of the Irish people who settled here. And didn't it almost slip away at one point? That's right, but it never quite vanished. So to me, Irish is a language of this country. It's in the streets of a Melbourne suburb, the heat of Australian summers. It's the language in which I speak to my daughter, in which I broadcast and in which I write. I'm conscious of its history here. How do you feel about the language itself? Well, Irish is a language of passionate songs and it has one of the oldest literatures in Western Europe. It's descended from the language of those Celts who arrived in the British Isles at the end of the Bronze Age, so it dates back thousands of years. But for me, what is truly remarkable is that when Ireland finally became independent early in the last century, the Irish language acquired renewed importance as a vehicle of scholarship. Now it has a television network and has achieved something inconceivable even 30 years ago. It has also become trendy and positively cool today. And what made you want to learn Irish as a language? (laughs) You may well ask. When I began learning the language, my enthusiasm was viewed as eccentric. Why? Well, some people thought that Irish Gaelic was dead, like Latin, although in fact it was still spoken as a first language by a few thousand people on the west coast of Ireland. So why did I learn it? Ireland wasn't a part of my childhood in any significant way. My great-grandparents had come here from Southern Ireland during the gold rush and we had become solidly Australian. But I liked languages and the worlds they could reveal. Irish promised me a world of my own. I was conscious, I think, that my people's past lay elsewhere. 
And your Irish ancestry has played a big part in your writing too, I believe. That's right. The stories I write in Irish are published only in Ireland, yet they deal with the peculiar situation of the language here in Australia. If I write in English, I use a language which has had time to adapt to a new history, a new society. It has its own accent, its own everyday language. This has also happened with Italian, but Italian is the first or second language of a whole community. Irish in this country is the language of scattered individuals, so it hasn't adapted to modern needs. As an Australian who writes in Irish, I must bring about the linguistic adaptation which has taken 200 years to accomplish in English. And yet you implied earlier that Irish had become fashionable. Is that the case in Australia? Well, yes. Here it actually means that every year a number of people go to Irish language classes and that a minority eventually become fluent. Irish has become a new trend because Ireland itself is now a major draw for tourists. Thousands of Australians visit Ireland every year to seek the house their great-grandmother was born in, Irish relatives. Others want to see the green landscape of old legends. For some, the Irish language is part of all this. I once interviewed a young woman from Melbourne who became so fascinated by traditional Irish singing that she learnt Irish and now works in the Aran Islands off the coast of Ireland. <laughs> and what other motivation would Australians have for learning Irish? Well, many will tell you that it's something to do with their interest in languages. But I would say that other motives are concealed in this phrase, motives as various as the individual's. It's also true, surely, that it allows the expression of an aspect of identity long suppressed, yet felt to be vital. Few people can bear to be rootless. We must all come from somewhere, and language is a fundamental part of identity. Not many feel the need to explore their past by learning Irish, but that even a few should do so is significant. Thank you, Patrick. It's been interesting talking to you. Thank you. Unit 3. Listening. Part 1. You'll hear three different extracts. For questions 1 to 6, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. There are two questions for each extract. Extract 1. You hear two friends talking about an incident one of them has seen. Now look at questions one and two. Guess what? I was going out for the day yesterday when I heard the most horrible noise. Oh, what was it? A huge lorry turning round. What, outside your house? Yeah, and he wasn't exactly careful about it either. What happened then? There was a large crunching noise. I thought he'd driven over my car. Did he wreck it completely? <laughs> well, to my astonishment, when he pulled away, the car didn't have a mark on it. What was the noise then? He'd completely flattened the street light. <laughs> there was glass everywhere. You must have been furious. Well, surprisingly, I wasn't. The look on the driver's face was priceless. He was horrified at what he'd done. I realised he was dreadfully embarrassed, poor man. What happened next? He leapt out of the lorry, knocked on the door and apologised. And then? He called the electricity company. They sent someone within an hour. Live electricity is dangerous. So everything was all right in the end? Well, it didn't make much difference to me, apart from not getting out when I planned. I was relieved that no one was hurt. Guess what? I was going out for the day yesterday when I heard the most horrible noise. Oh, what was it? A huge lorry turning round. What, outside your house? Yeah, and he wasn't exactly careful about it either. What happened then? There was a large crunching noise. I thought he'd driven over my car. Did he wreck it completely? <laughs> well, to my astonishment, when he pulled away, the car didn't have a mark on it. What was the noise then? He'd completely flattened the street light. <laughs> there was glass everywhere. You must have been furious. Well, surprisingly, I wasn't. The look on the driver's face was priceless. He was horrified at what he'd done. I realised he was dreadfully embarrassed, poor man. What happened next? He leapt out of the lorry, knocked on the door and apologised. And then? 
He called the electricity company. They sent someone within an hour. Live electricity is dangerous. So everything was all right in the end? Well, it didn't make much difference to me, apart from not getting out when I planned. I was relieved that no one was hurt. Extract 2 On the radio, you hear a zoo director talking about the orangutans at the zoo. Now look at questions 3 and 4. So, what about the orangutan in the news recently? Oh, yeah, Marla. She's rather clever. Last week, she climbed out of her enclosure, clutching her baby son, and headed for the cafeteria. Did that cause a stir at the zoo? Well, surprisingly, none of the visitors seemed overly concerned. Marla was so absorbed with what she was doing that she posed no real threat to anyone. But she did gather an admiring audience once she settled down with some bananas she'd taken. But then the baby is seriously cute. <laughs> so Marla was returned to her enclosure? Well, as soon as she saw the vet arrive to catch her, she knew what was going on and just calmly loped back of her own accord. <laughs> I thought it was extremely astute. Amazing. Mm, really astute. When she sees her curators are distracted, she'll take the keys from their pockets. But unlike some of the other orangutans, uh, she doesn't like playing with sign cards. Uh, we give them symbols for things like food. She seems to be streetwise, socially clever, but doesn't deal in abstracts. Fascinating. Yeah. So, what about the orangutan in the news recently? Oh, yeah, Marla. She's rather clever. Last week, she climbed out of her enclosure, clutching her baby son, and headed for the cafeteria. Did that cause a stir at the zoo? Well, surprisingly, none of the visitors seemed overly concerned. Marla was so absorbed with what she was doing that she posed no real threat to anyone. But she did gather an admiring audience once she settled down with some bananas she'd taken. But then the baby is seriously cute. <laughs> so Marla was returned to her enclosure? Well, as soon as she saw the vet arrive to catch her, she knew what was going on and just calmly loped back of her own accord. <laughs> I thought it was extremely astute. Amazing. Mm, really astute. When she sees her curators are distracted, she'll take the keys from their pockets. But unlike some of the other orangutans, uh, she doesn't like playing with sign cards. Uh, we give them symbols for things like food. She seems to be streetwise, socially clever, but doesn't deal in abstracts. Fascinating. Yeah. Extract 3 On the radio, you hear two people talking about a stonemason. Now look at questions 5 and 6. While I was in Cornwall last week, I saw a stonemason working on a statue. He was so intent on his work that he was oblivious to the fact that he was attracting a crowd of onlookers. Really? And then, when he finally stopped, everyone wanted to strike up a conversation with him. Why was that? Were they interested in buying something? Well, I'm sure most of them could have afforded to buy stylish art like this. They looked like city business people down for the weekend. But actually, they wanted to ask questions about the materials he used. So they were interested in what he was actually doing? Exactly. And then they asked him about his background. And finally, one woman said, it must be great earning your living by using your hands. But a stonemason probably doesn't earn a huge amount, unless he's really well known? That's right. Though the woman said, I wish I could afford to do something like that. Well, isn't it often the case that people in high-paid business jobs who spend their lives at a computer would love to do something more creative? You've got a point there. While I was in Cornwall last week, I saw a stonemason working on a statue. He was so intent on his work that he was oblivious to the fact that he was attracting a crowd of onlookers. Really? And then, when he finally stopped, everyone wanted to strike up a conversation with him. Why was that? Were they interested in buying something? Well, I'm sure most of them could have afforded to buy stylish art like this. They looked like city business people down for the weekend. But actually, they wanted to ask questions about the materials he used.
So they were interested in what he was actually doing. Exactly. And then they asked him about his background. And finally, one woman said, it must be great earning your living by using your hands. But a stonemason probably doesn't earn a huge amount, unless he's really well known. That's right. Though the woman said, I wish I could afford to do something like that. Well, isn't it often the case that people in high-paid business jobs who spend their lives at a computer would love to do something more creative? You've got a point there. Unit 4. Grammar. The people in the first photo are working in a lab. They may be students in a university, or it could be a hospital, but it's difficult to tell. It seems highly likely that they're doing some kind of research, though. They could be working separately, but it is more likely that they are working together, with the man taking notes. There's a strong likelihood that they are working with chemicals, as the woman has protective glasses on. This kind of work demands a high level of accuracy and must be very rewarding if you're good at it. In the second photo, the people are doing a tour of a famous place. They must have travelled to the place together with a tour guide. She might be telling them about the history of the area as she has something in her hand. She looks interested in what she's saying, even though she might have said the same thing lots of times before. It looks quite cold, as everyone is wearing coats, but it might well be summer in some northern European country. Unit 4. Listening. Part 4. You'll hear five short extracts in which people are talking about their jobs. Look at task 1. For questions 1 to 5, choose from the list A to H, each speaker's job. Now look at task 2. For questions 6 to 10, choose from the list A to H, what each speaker says they enjoy most about their job. While you listen, you must complete both tasks. Speaker 1. I need to stay on top of trends, as it's no good stocking stuff that nobody will want. If I want to put a new range of clothes in the shop, I have to drop an existing supplier, even if they've had a long relationship with us. There are two key seasons, early in the year and the summer, and during those months I go all over the place to international trade shows. I have to do really long days then, but I love the stimulus of going to different places. When I'm back in the office, I spend a lot of time looking at budgets and gross profits. Speaker 2 My job is all about giving instructions and processing large amounts of complex data. You also have to be able to cooperate with those working alongside you. We can't risk one person not pulling their weight, and it's a good feeling that we can all trust each other. Because situations can develop really quickly, you've got to stay calm and really be on the ball. The busier it is, the more you need to focus. There are so many people travelling nowadays that we're required 24 hours each day, so I work different shifts. But when it's time to go home, I take my headset off and I switch off completely. Speaker 3 I work closely with curators, deciding how things will be displayed and liaising with designers and project managers on anything from writing audio guides to discussing what should go on the website or in the shop. My other responsibility is to raise our international profile by travelling abroad. That could take over completely, but I make sure it doesn't. I start work early, around 7.30, and finish about 5.30 every day, so that's a real bonus, as I know the rest of the day is for my family. I have daily team meetings with curators, and about twice a week I meet people for marketing and we look at the promotion budgets. Speaker 4 
In this job, you have to accept that longer hours will be expected and required of you at times. I like the people I work with, but because we're all on top of each other, I sometimes see a little more of them than I want to. Each job I do is different. I might be working on a divorce case one week and a neighbourhood dispute the next. For the most part, I have to negotiate and communicate with two sides, so I'm always learning different ways of dealing with situations. That appeals to me. I get bored otherwise. I'm hoping one day I'll be able to take my skills abroad. Speaker 5 no two days are ever the same. I might start work in the office on the computer or I might head over to the building I'm working in. I often have to go shopping as I source everything myself. I have to predict trends two to three years ahead of the market, so I'm always thinking about what the next look is going to be. When everything's finished and I show the client what we've done, they sometimes burst into tears because they love it so much and that's the icing on the cake for me. Dealing with builders and suppliers while trying to keep to tight schedules is a real headache, though. Unit 5. Listening. Part 3. You'll hear an interview in which two people called Sarah and Peter, who work in Air and Sea Rescue, are talking about their work. For questions 1 to 6, choose the answer A, B, C or D, which fits best according to what you hear. Welcome. Today we're looking at careers in some of the more risky professions. My guests are Sarah Jessops and Peter Cavalli. They both work in an air and sea rescue team. Peter, let me ask you first, what made you want to do this job? I actually started training as a doctor, but I'm a very outdoors kind of person and I got this chance to learn to be a helicopter pilot. I've been able to use my medical skills, but that doesn't really give me an advantage. We all get excellent training in the practical and medical stuff, but what is emphasised over and over again is cooperation with the rest of the crew. Yeah, it all has to work like clockwork with everyone respecting each other. So if anyone thinks they know more than the rest or wants to give out instructions, the whole operation falls apart. And if you feel stressed, as we all do sometimes because we don't know what we're going into, we have to hide it, or it might put the others off. So, how does a typical rescue begin? Well, there isn't really a typical rescue, but they all start with a call to the office and we have just 15 minutes to check out our route and equipment to make sure we're ready for any eventuality. We're well prepared for whatever we might find out there, but our real enemy is the climatic conditions. That's what affects how straightforward a rescue will be, as a storm can change drastically from when the call comes through to when we get there. Most rescues take place within 20 miles of the shore, so our journey time isn't usually too long. But we did a rescue last week, which was much further out in the North Sea and much harder to locate. Yes, it was quite a large boat with six people on board, and they crossed from England to Holland in fine weather. When they were ready to come back, the forecast said the wind was going to change direction and a storm would develop, but conditions would only change slowly. So they were well aware of that, but set off with the sea as calm as a pond. They reckoned they'd get back with time to spare, but they hadn't thought it through properly. They'd foolishly based their timing on the outward journey, and, with the more challenging conditions which developed, they got into trouble halfway back. It must be hard flying the helicopter in a storm like that. We're used to it. One reason why helicopters are used in sea rescues is that, unlike planes, which have to circle round and round, they can hover above the scene, hardly moving. That's why they're also suited to rescues inland or from rocky cliff faces when any other form of transport would be very tricky. You've probably noticed the noise a helicopter makes though and when we're trying to rescue someone however much we shout they often can't hear us and the helicopter increases the wind chill factor too. We're all right as we're prepared but those in the water under us can get even colder than they already are. What about the people you're rescuing? Do they always do what you ask? Mostly. They're usually so pleased to see us that they follow instructions even if what we're asking them to do looks quite scary. In fact, they calm down when we get there, as we're in charge and they don't have to worry anymore. 
but some people then forget about the danger they're in and start trying to save all their possessions. They try to carry far too much with them instead of concentrating on saving themselves. <laughs> That's crazy, as it puts us all at risk, even though they don't realise it. So, will you both carry on in this job? I can't imagine giving it up. Well, I think I've gone as far as I can. There isn't anywhere else to go, apart from an office job. So I'm going to move inland and broaden my experience by joining a mountain rescue team. It's just as challenging, and what I've learnt from sea rescues is very relevant there. And I've been taking lots of extra courses, so I might become a trainer one day, but that's not on the cards just yet. Unit 6. Listening. Part 1. You'll hear three different extracts. For questions 1 to 6, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. There are two questions for each extract. Extract 1. You hear two friends talking about a book. Now look at questions 1 and 2. What did you think of the book I lent you, David? Well, it was slow to start with, Maria. Oh, I thought it was a real page-turner. Well, I did get into it once I worked out why all the characters kept contradicting themselves. It didn't seem plausible that they'd do that. Oh, I thought they were fantastic characters. The contradiction's all part of the plot, isn't it? Mm, I guess so. Did you like the descriptions of Istanbul? I did, yeah. I've never been there, but I'd love to see the places the author writes about. She was born there, so I imagine she's got the detail right, but I'd love to check that out for myself. Hmm. Is it a book you'd reread? Definitely. I like the style, and with the chapters all being told through the eyes of a different person, you get a varied perspective on what happens. Is that it, then? We never know what's really happened because no two people see things the same, and they change their minds from day to day. Absolutely. Not an original approach, but that's exactly what the author wanted to put across. Mm. What did you think of the book I lent you, David? Well, it was slow to start with, Maria. Oh, I thought it was a real page-turner. Well, I did get into it once I worked out why all the characters kept contradicting themselves. It didn't seem plausible that they'd do that. Oh, I thought they were fantastic characters. The contradiction's all part of the plot, isn't it? Mm, I guess so. Did you like the descriptions of Istanbul? I did, yeah. I've never been there, but I'd love to see the places the author writes about. She was born there, so I imagine she's got the detail right, but I'd love to check that out for myself. Mm. Is it a book you'd reread? Definitely. I like the style, and with the chapters all being told through the eyes of a different person, you get a varied perspective on what happens. Is that it, then? We never know what's really happened because no two people see things the same, and they change their minds from day to day? Absolutely. Not an original approach, but that's exactly what the author wanted to put across. Mm. Extract 2 you hear two people talking about a piece of jewellery. Now look at questions three and four. Great bracelet, Simon. This? Oh, I got it when I was a young man still living in Zambia. Oh, was it a gift? Well, it's been in my family for several generations. It came to me from my uncle, whose father, my grandfather, had worn it before him. It's made of elephant hair. Oh. In my tribe, the Kaondi, the elephant represents the good qualities of leadership. Anything with a link to an elephant is said to confer gifts of responsibility, hard work and success. So when he gave me this bracelet, my uncle was telling me he thought I had the capacity to be a leader. <laughs> That's fascinating. I wear the bracelet every day, and it makes me aware of the need to be focused in life. I see. So, when you look at it, you think about what really matters. And does it help with your work at the community centre? Lots of people there come from Africa, don't they? Yeah, or their parents did. So, anyone who had grown up in Zambia would look at this bracelet and understand the significance of it? Yes. People often mention it. Oh, 
That's really interesting. Great bracelet, Simon. This? Oh, I got it when I was a young man still living in Zambia. Oh, was it a gift? Well, it's been in my family for several generations. It came to me from my uncle, whose father, my grandfather, had worn it before him. It's made of elephant hair. Oh. In my tribe, the Kaonde, the elephant represents the good qualities of leadership. Anything with a link to an elephant is said to confer gifts of responsibility, hard work and success. So when he gave me this bracelet, my uncle was telling me he thought I had the capacity to be a leader. Oh, that's fascinating. I wear the bracelet every day, and it makes me aware of the need to be focused in life. I see. So when you look at it, you think about what really matters. And does it help with your work at the community centre? Lots of people there come from Africa, don't they? Yeah, or their parents did. So anyone who had grown up in Zambia would look at this bracelet and understand the significance of it? Yes, people often mention it. Oh, that's really interesting. Extract 3 You hear two women talking about clothes for a special occasion. Now look at questions 5 and 6. Well, I think this dress is the best thing so far, but I'll need something to go over it. Hmm, I like it, Louise. It's an unusual shade of pink. It wouldn't suit everyone, but it's good on you. How about a white jacket to go over it? Well, I was thinking I could just wrap a pashmina around me. I think they're warm and practical, but look quite glamorous. Yeah, you can wear them with anything, really, even over a coat. Right. You've decided not to get the trouser suit, then? Mm, well, it would be more useful, but I've got lots of others. Too much light work. Mm, OK, but the cream one you just tried on didn't look like something you'd wear to the office. What's Jack wearing, then? Oh, he's finally bought a really stunning new suit. What? After saying for years that no one was going to make him wear one? Absolutely. And he's paid a lot for it, too. It's a designer number. Great cut. That's a real turnaround. Isn't it? He's always been image conscious, of course, but that normally means searching the sales for T-shirts and jeans. <laughs> Good for him. Yeah. Well, I think this dress is the best thing so far, but I'll need something to go over it. Hmm, I like it, Louise. It's an unusual shade of pink. It wouldn't suit everyone, but it's good on you. How about a white jacket to go over it? Well, I was thinking I could just wrap a pashmina around me. I think they're warm and practical, but look quite glamorous. Yeah, you can wear them with anything, really, even over a coat. Right. You've decided not to get the trouser suit, then? Mm, well, it would be more useful, but I've got lots of others. Too much light work. Hmm, OK. But the cream one you just tried on didn't look like something you'd wear to the office. What's Jack wearing, then? Oh, he's finally bought a really stunning new suit. What? After saying for years that no one was going to make him wear one? Absolutely. And he's paid a lot for it, too. It's a designer number. Great cut. That's a real turnaround. Isn't it? He's always been image conscious, of course, but that normally means searching the sales for T-shirts and jeans. <laughs> Good for him. Yeah. Unit 7. Listening. Part 2. You'll hear a professional dancer giving a talk to performing arts students about dancing as a career. For questions 1 to 8, complete the sentences with a word or short phrase. Good morning. I'm so pleased to see so many of you here. I love my profession and I want to pass on some information to all of you who might want to focus on dance. There are two distinct career areas with different entry routes which I'd like to mention. Anyone wishing to do classical dance as a career needs to have attended classes from early childhood, so that may not be very helpful to some of you. It's very rare to be able to progress otherwise. 
Contemporary dance can be learnt later in life, however, and a number of colleges offer degrees in modern dance. Look carefully before you choose a degree course and make sure it suits you. Most tend to focus on the academic and technical aspects of dance rather than the skills required for performance. So it will be up to you to keep practicing while you're studying and attending lectures. And you'll also find you need to be networking all the time and working hard at your contacts. The more workshops you go to, the more people you'll meet, and some of them will be useful later on. Nobody is going to find jobs for you, you know, so you have to be willing to go out there and promote yourself. I was always taught at college that getting a job was rarely about just turning up for an audition and being picked. The people choosing between dancers will realise that you are willing to learn and take direction if you arrive with questions to ask. And actually, that's what lots of dancers fail to do, as they're concentrating so hard on their technique and how they look. All dancers love their work. But another thing you'll soon learn is that you won't be able to dance all the time. Not because of overwork or exhaustion, but because there are so many dancers out there that unemployment is a factor in every dancer's life. And you have to develop other skills as well to make money. You can combine performing with teaching, whether you set up classes yourself or work for an employer. Some dance agencies and government bodies have openings in administration and there are often opportunities because not many dancers think it's creative enough. A dancer's career can be short and in any event rarely lasts beyond the age of 40. Accept this and it won't stress you. And do remember that any injury, especially to the feet, back and legs, can have an impact and may reduce the length of career even further. So it's really important to understand your body and always take care not to push yourself too hard. Dancing's a fantastic career, but it's not an easy one. You have to be prepared to travel to get the work that suits you, particularly if you specialise in one type of dance. That's the only way to make a success of things, because the jobs won't come to you. OK, I'll pause there for a minute. So you... Unit 8. Listening. Part 4. You'll hear five short extracts in which people are talking about their jobs in television. Look at task 1. For questions 1 to 5, choose from the list A to H, each speaker's job. Now look at task 2. For questions 6 to 10, choose from the list A to H what each speaker says they find difficult about their job. While you listen, you must complete both tasks. Speaker 1 I do different shifts and I sometimes don't come off air until 10.30 if there's a big game on. I get a real buzz out of getting ready, going through my scripts and getting my makeup and hair done. Of course, however prepared you are, you don't know what's going to happen in a live event. Sometimes, if there's extra time in a match, we have to change the planned running order of a programme. That can be terrifying on live television. With a studio full of people, I'm on my own at that point. I also sometimes interview people live and pride myself on being able to get the best out of them, even if they are tired. Speaker 2 I work mainly on documentaries and most days are office-based, but the work fascinates me. A lot of time is spent on the phone getting the background for stories and producing detailed briefs for producers. Sometimes I'm struggling to find the right interviewee and other times I have too many and then I have to tell someone I'm not able to use them after all and deal with their disappointment. That can be hard. I do get out and about though. If I'm working on a live production, I'll give advice and support to the presenters during a broadcast. That sounds exotic, but in fact it means a lot of hanging around. Speaker 3 I work on soap operas, so I need to make everything look as natural as possible. It's not like working in a theatre where everything has to be very bright. I'm part of a team responsible for planning a set, and I operate the equipment, which has become more and more complex over the years. 
I have to make sure I make the most of the new technology as it's available. Sometimes, when you've got used to doing things a certain way, that can be annoying. I'll never be a millionaire, but no two days are the same, and there is usually a great atmosphere around production sets. Speaker 4 I love working in TV, as I get a really wide brief. It can take several hours to make someone look 20 years older than they really are, or make them look unwell, and some of the jobs I get are pretty demanding. But the real challenge is sitting with the same actor for a long period of time. Sometimes we have a really good chat and sometimes we don't say much. But there are actors who use it as a chance to go over everything that's going wrong in their lives. And I'm stuck then. It can get a bit too much. But nothing beats the satisfaction of the actor looking in the mirror and saying, wow. Speaker 5 Although my job is hard work, it's great fun and very fulfilling. Sadly, though, in my line of business, we always end up at the bottom of the credits at the end of a TV programme, even though a production wouldn't get anywhere without us. To do my job, you need to have a good ear and be able to pick out any undesirable noise. I've also had to learn to be very patient. Most of my time is spent standing around waiting for decisions to be made. That doesn't bother me. I'm glad it's up to the producer to get the whole thing to come together. I wouldn't want that job. Unit 9. Listening. Part 2. You'll hear a zoology student called Anna Samuels giving a presentation to other students about a trip she made to find out about cheetahs, the fastest moving large cats in Africa. For questions 1 to 8, complete the sentences with a word or short phrase. Last month, I spent some time at a cheetah conservation centre in Namibia in southwest Africa. Anyone can go. You don't need to be an expert, but they emphasise that you have to be flexible. There's such a wide range of tasks you might be involved in. And, of course, you need to be tolerant of high temperatures and able to walk on rough terrain. I'd always dreamt of sleeping under the African stars, but there were so many strange noises, I didn't really enjoy it. We had all our meals outside and made a proper campfire and barbecued food on it. I wasn't particularly good at any of that, but learning to bake bread was fantastic and I took on that role. The fire made it taste so much better than an indoor oven. And of course, the work was so interesting. Cheetahs are a bit like sports cars, designed for speed. They're long and slim rather than muscular like a lion or tiger. And unlike other members of the cat family, their paws are extremely narrow with claws which grip the ground in a similar way to a car tyre. They look quite similar to leopards, but I soon learnt to tell them apart. So, what was I actually doing? Well, I helped to follow the movements of the cheetahs. The data was collected in a special collar which had been perfected after years of research. Scientists wanted a way of attaching something very light and small to the animals, which could be powered by solar batteries, and now they've done it. I was following three female and two male cheetahs. The equipment was only activated when the animal moved, and it recorded where each cheetah was, which direction it was headed, and how fast it was moving, with the data being sent up to 300 times a second via radio signals. I'd always thought that cheetahs are such good hunters because they run so fast, but in fact, I discovered that what gives them a huge advantage is their ability to turn sideways. This is something they can do in a second or so when they spot some food, and it's that, rather than the way they move forwards, which makes them so agile. We wanted to check on when the cheetahs preferred to hunt, expecting it to be the cooler ends of the day. This indeed was the case, but our research showed that more hunting took place at dawn than at twilight, and that some hunting was even done at night. We also looked at where the cheetahs spend their time. They're mostly seen in open grassland, only occasionally venturing among shrubs and trees. But in fact, what the tracking equipment unexpectedly revealed was that they also headed into thick vegetation sometimes, 
leaving the open ground. It was so interesting to learn more about these beautiful creatures and how they live. I'm really hoping I can return to the centre again next year. Unit 10. Listening. Part 1. You'll hear three different extracts. For questions 1 to 6, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. There are two questions for each extract. Extract 1. You hear two people talking in a university about studying abroad. Now look at questions 1 and 2. Oh, hi Fiona. How was student life in France? Great. I could choose whatever courses I wanted at the university, so I decided to spread my wings and take art history and philosophy, as well as literature and translation. Impressive. The new subjects were awesome, but the teaching approach was rather daunting, really. All the classes were formal lectures. They were clear and well-delivered, but you had to be brave to ask a question in such large groups. But your French improved? By miles! Was living in a different culture a positive experience? I was terrified I wouldn't understand the lectures, but I did. I was also a bit annoyed at first that the French students didn't talk to me much. I felt quite lonely. Hmm, I bet that was tough. Yeah, then I thought about my first two years at university in England, how I just never considered making an effort with exchange students who wanted to practice their English. I vowed I would change that when I got back. And you became more proactive over there? Yeah, and I soon made loads of friends who I miss now. Oh, hi Fiona. How was student life in France? Great. I could choose whatever courses I wanted at the university, so I decided to spread my wings and take art history and philosophy, as well as literature and translation. Impressive. The new subjects were awesome, but the teaching approach was rather daunting, really. All the classes were formal lectures. They were clear and well-delivered, but you had to be brave to ask a question in such large groups. But your French improved? By miles! Was living in a different culture a positive experience? I was terrified I wouldn't understand the lectures, but I did. I was also a bit annoyed at first that the French students didn't talk to me much. I felt quite lonely. Hmm, I bet that was tough. Yeah, then I thought about my first two years at university in England, how I just never considered making an effort with exchange students who wanted to practice their English. I vowed I would change that when I got back. And you became more proactive over there? Yeah, and I soon made loads of friends who I miss now. Extract 2 You hear two people talking in a shop. Now look at questions 3 and 4. This is a really interesting shop. I'm glad we came. It only opened yesterday. Everything's really expensive though, don't you think? Well, some stuff is quite pricey, but you'd expect that in a shop where everything is made from recycled materials. But there's also stuff that's really affordable and every day. Things made from recycled tyres and newsprint don't sound very attractive. <laughs> I thought that before I came in. But what is extraordinary is that there's nothing in this shop that wouldn't look out of place in a design magazine. Maybe, but I don't think we need more shops selling stuff like this. There are already loads of them. And anyway, most of the large chain stores sell modern trendy furniture and things that look good. And they're cheap. That's true, I suppose. What annoys me is, because this shop's put so much into its advertising, people will be conned into thinking they're getting something special, stuff they think they need, and they'll be queuing at the door. Hmm, but I think it deserves that, especially as everything is sourced with its environmental impact in mind. That certainly makes it worthwhile. This is a really interesting shop. I'm glad we came. It only opened yesterday. Everything's really expensive, though, don't you think? Well, some stuff is quite pricey, but you'd expect that in a shop where everything is made from recycled materials. But there's also stuff that's really affordable and everyday. 
Things made from recycled tyres and newsprint don't sound very attractive. <laughs> I thought that before I came in. But what is extraordinary is that there's nothing in this shop that wouldn't look out of place in a design magazine. Maybe, but I don't think we need more shops selling stuff like this. There are already loads of them. And anyway, most of the large chain stores sell modern trendy furniture and things that look good. And they're cheap. That's true, I suppose. What annoys me is, because this shop's put so much into its advertising, people will be conned into thinking they're getting something special, stuff they think they need, and they'll be queuing at the door. Hmm, but I think it deserves that, especially as everything is sourced with its environmental impact in mind. That certainly makes it worthwhile. Extract 3 you hear an interview with a woman who is a trapeze artist in a circus. Now look at questions 5 and 6. So, Josie, you obviously love your job. I do. When you do a great performance on the trapeze, it's such an incredible feeling. Even though I go through the same routine night after night, it always turns out slightly differently. It's a real challenge physically, but what I do is also an art. I'm putting a message across through the way I move. I try to project that feeling to the audience, but we're so high up that you can't see whether they're appreciating it or not. <laughs> and it must be quite dangerous. Yes, it's a bit like being a pilot. You see, when you're flying a plane with several hundred people on board, you can't be nervous. And when there are 5,000 people watching you in the circus tent, you need to keep your cool. A pilot, of course, has all the responsibility for a plane. But we are totally dependent on each other. One bad move and someone could get hurt. We have to be ready to change our routine if something does go wrong. And a pilot doesn't have that flexibility. If something goes wrong, there's not much he or she can do. That's right. So, Josie, you obviously love your job. I do. When you do a great performance on the trapeze, it's such an incredible feeling. Even though I go through the same routine night after night, it always turns out slightly differently. It's a real challenge physically, but what I do is also an art. I'm putting a message across through the way I move. I try to project that feeling to the audience, but we're so high up that you can't see whether they're appreciating it or not. <laughs> and it must be quite dangerous. Yes, it's a bit like being a pilot. You see, when you're flying a plane with several hundred people on board, you can't be nervous. And when there are 5,000 people watching you in the circus tent, you need to keep your cool. A pilot, of course, has all the responsibility for a plane. But we are totally dependent on each other. One bad move and someone could get hurt. We have to be ready to change our routine if something does go wrong. And a pilot doesn't have that flexibility. If something goes wrong, there's not much he or she can do. That's right. Unit 11. Grammar. Exercise 1C. But we had an amazing time. So this is one of the pictures I took. The Taj Mahal was absolutely fantastic. Have you ever been there? No, but if I got the chance, I would. I'd go to India like a shot. I didn't have the money when I was a student, but now I'm working, I'm intending to travel a lot more if I have time. Well, I'd certainly recommend going to India. I'm sure you'd love it if you went. And if I do go, I'll travel around as much as I can, just like you did. Well, I certainly loved every minute of my trip. But I didn't realise how hot it would be in June. If I'd known, I'd have gone earlier in the year instead. Unit 11. Listening. Part 3. You'll hear an interview in which a writer called Peter Dell is talking about the Brooklyn Bridge in New York. For questions 1 to 6, choose the answer A, B, C or D, which fits best according to what you hear. And on the book programme tonight, I welcome writer Peter Dell, who has just published a book about the Brooklyn Bridge in New York. Thank you. 
Readers of your book will realise at once that you feel very emotional about New York's famous bridge, Peter. Is it a place you visit often? I go across it whenever I'm in New York. The atmosphere is very evocative. You sense it the moment you arrive at the bridge. If you approach it from the Brooklyn side, you can see Manhattan in the distance and the sun going down like a giant red beach ball behind the skyscrapers. If you go in the winter, the cold gives an edge to everything, a sharpening of the senses. The buildings you can see are a memory of everything that has passed before. But at the same time, there's the solid presence of the Statue of Liberty to remind you that things do survive, and I like that. And as the sunlight fades, the darkness brings a sense of mystery to the city. And of course, as you walk across the bridge, you're aware of all kinds of traffic, aren't you? Absolutely, the traffic thunders across, loud and ugly. But the pedestrian walkway is one level above the bridge, so there's a feeling that you're rising above life itself. The river below always reminds me that our ancestors arrived there on ships, so it feels welcoming. And below the river is the subway, where people will always hurry to and from work. And if you look up, you often see a helicopter taking off. So the bridge works in a figurative way, representing past, present, and future. It's something poets like Walt Whitman and Marianne Moore have written about. Tell us something about the construction of the bridge, Peter. It was started in 1870 and completed 13 years later. It cost just over 15 million dollars to build, and about 30 lives were lost, which people thought was acceptable at the time, but we certainly wouldn't now. It was designed by a man called John Roebling. At the time, it was the longest suspension bridge in the world, and its two granite towers were the largest in the Western Hemisphere. The caissons—that's the underground chambers they used to do underwater work—were made from rot-resistant yellow pine wood, which means that even today, tens of thousands of tons of masonry still rest on them. I was quite taken aback when I found out about that. I see. And how do you think most pedestrians feel as they walk across the bridge today? Well, you have to remember that when the bridge was built, there were no skyscrapers in New York, so people who crossed it in the early years felt as if they were walking up in the clouds. It's a very different experience these days, but it's still a real thrill for anyone walking over those wooden boards. I think the reason for that is the unique pattern of steel cables strung like a harp along the side of the bridge. It looks like a giant has left it there. It's one of the special characteristics of the bridge. The bridge has been involved in some momentous events, hasn't it? Yeah, it's attracted its fair share of madmen and would-be murderers. There was even a plot to destroy it by cutting through the support wires. Fortunately, that was foiled, but it's been fraudulently sold over and over again to gullible people who really should know better. And copies of it have been blown up in the film studios. But apart from the odd ship colliding with it, the real one has never suffered lasting damage. And to finish, Peter, there's one interesting quality the bridge has for you, isn't there? I realized there was something rather special, but in the circumstances, rather odd about the bridge some time ago. Now I've never been there and been completely alone. There's always a cyclist or a lone jogger about. I don't think it's possible to be totally alone, physically at least, in New York. But despite that. Every so often, you get this isolated instance of total quiet on the bridge, particularly when it's been snowing, and it's only when you suddenly hear a car or the barges sounding their horns on the river below that you realize, as you're walking along high above, what has just happened. Unit Twelve, Listening, Part One. You'll hear three different extracts. For questions one to six, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. There are two questions for each extract. Extract one. 
you hear part of a radio discussion about monarch butterflies. Now look at questions one and two. So, monarch butterflies live in the Rocky Mountains of North America, don't they? That's right. But unlike other insects in temperate climates, they can't survive a long cold winter. So they overwinter either along the Californian coast or high in the mountains of Mexico. Is there a consistent pattern to their behaviour? Well, the migration is driven by seasonal changes. Both daylight and temperature influence the movement of the monarch. Hmm. And is this migration unusual? Well, in fact, no other butterflies migrate quite like these do. They travel much further than any other species. Oh, and where do they settle? Well, they fly in masses to the same winter roosts, often the same tree. Unbelievable, I think. Really, it's an amazing sight. That's more the type of migration you expect from birds and whales, surely. Except that unlike birds and whales, these butterflies have a very short lifespan, so only a small proportion make the migration trip. They only do it once, then. To explain it in human terms, it's actually their children's grandchildren that return south the following fall.、Oh, I see. So monarch butterflies live in the Rocky Mountains of North America, don't they? That's right. But unlike other insects in temperate climates, they can't survive a long cold winter. So they overwinter either along the Californian coast or high in the mountains of Mexico. Is there a consistent pattern to their behaviour? Well, the migration is driven by seasonal changes. Both daylight and temperature influence the movement of the monarch. Hmm. And is this migration unusual? Well, in fact, no other butterflies migrate quite like these do. They travel much further than any other species. Oh, and where do they settle? Well, they fly in masses to the same winter roosts, often the same tree. Unbelievable, I think. Really, it's an amazing sight. That's more the type of migration you expect from birds and whales, surely. Except that unlike birds and whales, these butterflies have a very short lifespan, so only a small proportion make the migration trip. They only do it once, then. To explain it in human terms, it's actually their children's grandchildren that return south the following fall.、Oh, I see. Extract two. You hear two friends talking about the final of a cookery competition they saw on television. Now look at questions three and four. Did you watch the Cook of the Year final? You bet. The winning dish Salima cooked yesterday was really unusual. The colours were fantastic. Yeah, I felt she pulled out all the stops just when it mattered. She hasn't performed consistently throughout the competition, though. She's had real ups and downs. I thought Ali should have got the prize. He performed so steadily in all the other rounds. Hmm. Well, at the key moment, Salima shone, and he let himself down. Hmm. I wonder if the next series will be the same. I enjoy watching it, but it is getting a bit repetitive. Oh, I like that. It's reassuring. Although it would be good to have someone new on the expert chef panel to make their decisions. Well, I think they need a few innovative features each week. What, like、um, something about the countries the recipes come from? Exactly. Huh? Maybe they should try a program where people can only cook in one particular style. You know, Italian, Thai, whatever. Hmm. Sounds good in theory, but would it be rather limiting? Well, I suppose it might be. Did you watch the Cook of the Year final? You bet. The winning dish Salima cooked yesterday was really unusual. The colours were fantastic. Yeah, I felt she pulled out all the stops just when it mattered. She hasn't performed consistently throughout the competition, though. She's had real ups and downs. I thought Ali should have got the prize. He performed so steadily in all the other rounds. Hmm. Well, at the key moment, Salima shone, and he let himself down.、Mm. I wonder if the next series will be the same. I enjoy watching it, but it is getting a bit repetitive. Oh, I like that. It's reassuring. 
Although it would be good to have someone new on the expert chef panel to make their decisions. Well, I think they need a few innovative features each week. What, like um, something about the countries the recipes come from? Exactly. Huh. Maybe they should try a program where people can only cook in one particular style. You know, Italian, Thai, whatever. Mm, sounds good in theory, but would it be rather limiting? Well, I suppose it might be. Extract three. You hear two friends discussing a trip to a game park in South Africa. Now look at questions five and six. Hi, Claire. How was the South African trip then? Oh, it was fantastic, Peter. And the best part was the game park, just like you'd led me to expect. Well, we went two years ago, and I've never forgotten seeing all those animals for real. Elephants, lions, giraffe. It's so much better than seeing them on screen. Huge animals suddenly emerging from the trees. Oh, and the landscape. Wide horizons in every direction. Yeah, and what about those sunsets? They were just out of this world, weren't they? But we did have one rather unnerving encounter. Oh? Yeah, with an elephant. It started poking at the windows of our jeep with its trunk. Then it sort of wrapped itself around the vehicle and started wiggling it. That must have been scary. Well, not really. Well, elephants can be aggressive. Not this one. It jostled the jeep with its tusks and then just turned and walked away. Uh, was it after the provisions you had on board? I think it was probably just wondering what we were. And having checked us out, it left us alone. You won't forget that. Certainly won't. Hi, Claire. How was the South African trip then? Oh, it was fantastic, Peter. And the best part was the game park, just like you'd led me to expect. Well, we went two years ago and I've never forgotten seeing all those animals for real. Elephants, lions, giraffe. It's so much better than seeing them on screen. Huge animals suddenly emerging from the trees. Oh, and the landscape. Wide horizons in every direction. Yeah, and what about those sunsets? They were just out of this world, weren't they? But we did have one rather unnerving encounter. Oh? Yeah, with an elephant. It started poking at the windows of our jeep with its trunk. Then it sort of wrapped itself around the vehicle and started wiggling it. That must have been scary. Well, not really. Well, elephants can be aggressive. Not this one. It jostled the jeep with its tusks and then just turned and walked away. Uh, was it after the provisions you had on board? I think it was probably just wondering what we were. And having checked us out, it left us alone. You won't forget that. Certainly won't. Unit 13. Grammar. Exercise 2. The people in the top picture look as though they're having to work really hard. That's probably because whitewater rafting tends to be a very serious hobby, whereas rowing can be enjoyed by anyone. Some people won't agree with that, however, because they'll say you can be very serious about rowing too. I just mean that anyone can go rowing on a lake, even if they haven't made any preparations. Whereas it's more important to plan properly if you go rafting. The weather can change suddenly in the mountains and it doesn't look very good in this picture. They seem to have decided to go rafting despite the bad weather. But maybe it wasn't like that when they started. These people must have planned their trip properly as they seem to have the right equipment with them. Although rafting can be quite dangerous, some people have been known to attempt it without the right equipment. I've only ever been rafting once. We didn't have all the right things and I got really scared. After that, I decided rafting wasn't for me. I wouldn't go again even if you paid me. Unit 13. Listening. Part 2 you'll hear a sports trainer called Bradley Robbins talking to a group of sports science students 
about his job with a professional basketball team. For questions one to eight, complete the sentences with a word or short phrase. Hello, I'm going to give you some insight into what's actually involved in my job as a basketball trainer. What I enjoy most is seeing an athlete perform at a high level, knowing that I helped them get there. There are numerous challenges, of course, but most of the time things go smoothly unless there's a breakdown in communication. Everything goes wrong then, from training programs right down to players' concentration. If the coaches, management, players, and medical staff aren't on the same track, I was lucky enough to study sports science at college, like you, and most of what we did is still relevant. But there have been massive developments in the psychology of sport in areas such as the motivation for athletes to succeed. What is constant, though, is the human body. I'm grateful for all the hours we spent in those classes, as I use my depth of knowledge every day, much more than practical skills. A large part of my job is obviously assessing injuries, and interestingly, although back problems put players out of the sport for greater lengths of time, it's damage to ankles which dominates. Longer term, some players have problems with their knees, and that can end their career altogether. We have to assess new trends in sports training to see if they're really going to benefit our players. A lot of companies knock on our door with the latest equipment and training programs to improve players' strength, but I find they're not worth the money, and it's more effective to concentrate on injury prevention and general health. That's what has the most impact on results. The daily exercise schedule I use with the team hasn't changed much over the years. Strangely enough, it's the simplest exercises which aim to help players balance that are the most beneficial to their game. Around those, we also do lots of practice on technique, of course, and individual skills. After a big series of matches, I keep an eye on the players as it's easier for them to switch off and get into bad habits. They'll be exhausted and they need some time to sleep and rest. I make sure I suggest a nutrition program to help them restore the energy they've lost. Every sports trainer implements a team's fitness program in a different way. But what I have learned is that in order to get the best out of the players, I have to understand their personalities and which method is going to best suit each one. Once I have the right methods for each one, their fitness levels will improve much faster, and they will develop the skills they need. Of all the things I've talked about, having a flexible approach, a constant awareness of what's going on in the team, and specialised knowledge, we shouldn't ignore a sense of humour. Without that, none of the rest will work. It's a very challenging job, and things go wrong all the time, so you won't get far without it. Thank you very much for listening. Unit fourteen, listening, part two. You'll hear a man called Adam Campbell talking to a group of young business people about his experience of going to live and work in Romania. For questions one to eight. Complete the sentences with a word or short phrase. I'm Adam Campbell. As you may be able to tell from my accent, I'm Scottish. But Louisa, my wife, is Romanian. She was working in Scotland as marketing manager for the local radio station when we met. I had a job working in the finance department of a hospital when we came across an ad for the position of chief accountant for a pharmaceuticals company in Romania. We were delighted when I got it. Louisa went and found us a flat, but then the company brought the moving date forward by a month. We'd arranged to get our furniture shipped over,、uh, but instead we were faced with an empty flat. It had all the appliances, like washing machine, etc., but we had to furnish it in a few days. So we had no choice except to buy more. That was the difficult bit, but we were soon settled. I knew it snowed a lot in Romania in winter, and I thought, "Oh no, everything will come to a standstill." But in fact, everything carries on more or less as normal. In Scotland, it's quite cool and rains a lot, so it did take me a while to get used to the heat at some times of the year. Thankfully, we're not too far from the mountain resorts in the Carpathians, so we often escape at weekends. It's really good for hiking, but that's not really my thing. I'm into cycling, and the mountain roads are perfect for that. My wife would spend all her free time rock climbing if she could, so she does that, and we're both happy. Most of the time, we're going backwards and forwards to work each day. There are loads of trams and buses in the city centre, but they deteriorate as you get further out. And in the suburb where we live, there's very little public transport, although that is starting to improve. 
There are loads of restaurants, though, whichever part of the city you're in, and I've acquired a taste for certain aspects of the cuisine. When I first arrived, people kept giving me soup to taste, insisting that this was the local speciality. It's a special one, made with meat, cream and vegetables. It's very good, of course, but I've come to prefer a kind of cabbage roll stuffed with minced meat. Delicious! There's plenty to do here. I'm not yet fluent in Romanian, so we don't tend to go to the cinema much, but we go to concerts, as music is accessible to anyone. I can follow some television programs, and some are in English with subtitles, so that's good for me. And we do a lot of socialising. The Romanians love a family party. Most people have a good time at a party in Scotland, but they run out of stamina by about midnight. But here they're still dancing away, whether they're seven or seventy. I like that. And although there are lots of things I miss about Scotland, I wouldn't want to go back there to live now. So if you're considering working in Romania...